Hello everybody and welcome to the Stormkeep. My name is Paul and today we are going to be talking about list building for Season 3. And today I'm joined by... This is Jack. This is David. Hey, this is Morgan. Hey guys, this is John. I'm known as Corbs on the Discord. And uh, yeah, happy to be here. So today we are talking about Season 3 list building. There's been a big shakeup in the rules, both in terms of uh, new seasonal rules, but also core rule changes that have come out. Uh, there's a new meta that we need to face off. There's tons of cool new spells. There's endless spells are a big problem uh, and lots of new battle tactics that we need to consider. Uh, so before we go into it proper, what are your guys' first impressions? It's, I guess, first impressions. It's been about a month, but <laughs> what do you guys think about list building so far uh, for Stormcast in particular this season? Yeah, list building has been very interesting because I think a lot of the lists that we were running before uh, needed a fair amount of tweaks, you know, like I think at first it seemed like, okay, we need more wizards or, you know, we need more anti-wizard stuff. We need more ways um, to be utilizing things like scintillating trail um, or finding ways to, you know, make sure that we're using some of these new cheaper endless spells. Uh, but the more games that, you know, I played in the new season, the more I started to realize that my best bet in the style that I played was to, you know, save those primal dice uh, for unbinds and dispels, uh, and that my wizard loadout didn't really need to change all that much until I started playing even more games and really started to realize uh, how difficult our battle tactics were this season. And that led me towards what Ragon was talking about earlier around kind of building to the GHB um, and sort of made me make some decisions that I certainly would not have made last season, but that has opened up sort of an additional two or three kind of potential medium to easy difficulty but battle tactics uh, within the book that, you know, I just uh, was sort of ignoring before. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've found, like, battle tactics have become the driving force in whether or not uh, my list or Stormcast in general can actually win games. Yeah, it it was definitely pitched as, like, the wizard season or the anti-wizard season, but it's really turned into the, the teleport season, <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> Like every list I build, I'm always thinking like, okay, how am I scoring surround and destroy? That has to be scored every mm -hmm. game. And if I mm -hmm. just have a translocation, that's not good enough. I need to have a translocation and a Knight Zephyros or a translocation and Vanguard Hunters or, you know, two units of Vanguard Hunters or something like that. Like it needs, that needs to be more teleporting going on. Surround and destroy is actually a really good example that has influenced me a lot surprisingly because it's it, it really is one that you want to be able to do I, i'm usually able to do it on turn two or maybe three but like yeah you really want to be able to do it and I, I found it's it's even caused me to change how i deploy um so that's been yeah really interesting and <laughs> a bit annoying yeah sometimes i'll uh off my deployment i'll put my long strikes down usually near the end as much as i can and I'll just try to snipe off whatever unit my opponent puts on a flank by itself because I know they're setting that up to score surround and destroy. And it's like, oh, well, there's there's two victory points gone from you. <laughs> you know, like, what else are you going to do this Yeah, time? That's smart. The map is really big. Like, you can't get it. You literally cannot get surround and destroy if you don't have teleporting or you're not thinking about it from the beginning. Um... I think, from my perspective at least, I do appreciate that GW is trying to pull more people away from the one drop. For yeah. example, the we'll probably get into it later, but the battalions they added this season, I think it's the first season I've actually I've gone away from the one drop. Because anybody who knows me in the Discord knows that I am a one drop purist. But I think this is the first season where I'm genuinely okay with taking one of the battalions to go three drop. I agree with that. Uh, I think the Battalions are really good, and Torian Acolytes in particular is really, really good. Having played OBR at a GT uh, this past weekend, uh, having a key extra primal dice for an extra unbind or a critical spell you need to get off is really, really good. Um, and it gave me the edge over so many opponents who were trying to get Horfrost off on like a big group of something to you know uh, go through my defenses or trying to get Merciless Blizzard off, or even trying to get something like a Mystic Shield off. Um, 
Yeah, I love it. I don't think you don't you I think you always try and take Antorian Acolytes as far as it's concerned. But we'll talk about that later. Primal Dice are a big win in my book. I love this re- this soft revamp to the magic system. Um coupled with with three spells that are well, two spells that are awesome and one spell that's ruining the game. But <laughs> I think everybody I think everybody likes Merciless Blizzard and Horfrost. I think they're super fun. Really change up the way the game works and it flattens the power level of like powerful buffs you can give your units and also powerful offensive spells every army can do this now um, and it feels really good agreed um <clears throat> my take for this and it's not just with list building i my personal belief is that this is probably the best general's handbook we've gotten in third edition um everything about this ghb feels good and fun to play with the exception of the rupture spell yeah rupture is is making the game worse hopefully hopefully that won't be the case by the time this video goes live but who knows (laughs) (laughs) hopefully we won't have to wait too long before they change that because it's pretty well agreed that wild cron spines max level and top of round one that's just not fun to play against nobody likes that yeah i think I, I, I hope that this gets eroded to be targeting an enemy cron spine. Um, being able to make your own cron spine go wild at will and then feed it an endless spell turn one sucks. Yeah. It sucks bad. <laughs> yeah. It's not even fun to play it because there's so many ways it can fail and blow up in your face, but it's so reliable that it's like you just roll the dice and you're you're okay, you know? Yep. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yep. I did a hollow heart every all five games, just top it took top of turn one, took a battle regiment. I made sure my Malastorm was at tick was at had when I casted it and then I cast the rest of my spells that it would be at five. So my crossbine would eat it at five, so it would blow up when I wanted it to blow up on the on the eating rampage. Yeah. And it was like and all my opponents were like, You're a nice dude, but like screw that list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the maelstrom is another another spell I think needs to be it needs to be errated. Yeah. I think it's going to go up 20, 30. I think that's just how you fix it. Just make it more expensive. Just make, make it 50 expensive. points. That's it. That's all it needs. Sure. Before we get started into our proper discussion, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Kaiju Gaming Lounge. They are the official sponsor of the Stormkeep podcast. They're located in Orlando, Florida. They sell Warhammer as well as custom gaming tools. Uh, you can use code Stormkeep for 15% off. In addition to stocking Warhammer at 15% off, you can also get the Stormkeep merch. They, we sell these fancy little 9-inch, 7-inch rangefinder sticks. These are great if you want to uh, drop your units into play in style, but also really good if you're dropping Thunderstrike units with the Lord Imperitant 7 inches away. Uh, these are super handy if you're playing Grand Hammers or Questers, or if you're playing uh, Starborn Seraphon and you're using them to summon units 7 inches away or drop them in from reserve. Uh, more dice are coming to the store soon, so keep an eye out. Uh, Kaiju Gaming Lounge also supplies us with all of our painting prize contest. <laughs> painting contest prizes. I got it that time. so big shout out to kaiju gaming lounge thank you very much for your support and if you guys are interested uh look them up they're great guys all right so let's talk about the major changes that happened in aos season three uh that caused us to get so excited about building stormcast lists in particular that we have geez like over a dozen lists here to talk about (laughs) so uh, first up, we've got new rules with the new season. Uh, so the Antorian Locusts are a keyword. They're a thing. It's a wizard hero with less than 10 wounds that is not unique. So uh, you can't do this with Astraea Soulbright, unfortunately, but every other hero that can take an Arcane Tome is looking a lot better all of a sudden. If you're going second in the round, one of your Locusts can cast and unbind one more spell that round. And I've also found the second part of this rule gets underplayed, but instead of picking the ability to get more casts and unbinds, you can just take a command point. And that honestly feels pretty good, too. Getting an extra command point is... is Got to keep that one in mind. Sometimes that's what you need more than another cast. Especially, I, mean, I like it for armies that are really command point heavy, too, but don't really have any wizards to take advantage of. Like, Fire Slayers and KO love extra command points. They're, they're a very command point heavy army, so... Mm-hmm. And I find those players playing those armies just forget about that all the time. They just ignore this rule because, oh, I don't know a wizard, whatever. But <laughs> you can get a command point, too. The extra dispel really, really matters. Having yes, two does. spells yes, and two dispels does. means on one cast wizards, you can go like Mystic Shield and uh, whatever spell you took from the lore. I think that's incredible. Yeah, and it's Merciless Blizzard, for the record. The spell you took should be Merciless Blizzard. Yeah, sure. <laughs> or or, 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 or Frost, depending on you know what you're running. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, both. Yeah, or both if you pick Shaman of the Chilled Lands, which is which uh, is a, a much better command trait than we thought it was going to be. Uh, speaking command of... Trait there is. 
Speaking of the lore of Primal Frost, uh, this is for Locust only. You can cast Hoarfrost, which is a great damage steroid for any melee unit. Uh, Rupture, which causes Cron Spines to go wild and ruin the game for both players. And Merciless Blizzard, which causes you to kill anything on the table and ruins the game for both players. In a good way. To facilitate these new spells, because they have such crazy high casting values, we get Primal Magic, which are extra casting dice that get randomly assigned at the start of each player's turn. And you can also take a battalion that gives you more, which is which is super fun to actually this build around. Uh, but these dice can be used by any wizard for any cast, any unbind, and any dispel roll, which is really awesome when all of a sudden your <laughs> your opponent forgets that Draculines can unbind, and you have three primal dice sitting there just ready to dispel something. It feels very, very good to do that. We also have new battalions. The Antorian Acolytes, like I mentioned, allows you to get a chance at an extra primal dice each turn. And we have Wizard Finders of Antor, which is an underrated battalion. I think you're going to see a lot of it in these particular lists that we're talking about today. Uh, I don't think it's as powerful as we might be giving off. I don't want to give the impression that it's like a must-have battalion or anything. Uh, but it's like, if you're going for more drops and you have infantry, why not? Why not use it, you know? Um, so to that point, the, the, my issue with Wizard Finders is this. So when we spoke about Antorian Acolytes in our... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, review of the last season. Uh, we talked about how Antorian Acolytes isn't competing with Battle Regiment. It's really competing with Warlord. Because if you want to be a lowest drop army, you will be the lowest drop army with Battle Regiment. You don't care about this. Yep. But Warlord is what it's competing with. But uh, So I feel the same about Wizard Finders. If you're the kind of guy, or sorry, if you're the kind of player who wants to take Antorian Acolytes with a Primal Dice but still have a reasonable drop number, I think you just go Acolytes and Battle Regiment. I don't think you ever go Wizard Finders of Antor, because I think the buff that it gives you is weaker than what a Warlord or Command Entourage would give you. Agreed. And in a lot of cases, it's just not worth it, in my opinion. It, because it be. it's not that... if it, if it Maybe it was, it was tweaked to something like, if you're within three inches of a Wizard, you get an extra attack, so you can, like... You know, kind of like how Catacross gets extra attacks when he's within three of a hero. So you can sort of cheese it to, like... Not actually fight the hero, but fight something else, but activate Catacross by being within three of a hero in, during a pile-in. That would be better. But the fact that you have to attack that wizard unit is, in my opinion, not worth it. I think Acolytes in Battle Regiment is, or just pure Battle Regiment is going to be the style uh, yeah. for a lot of armies. Sure. Yeah, it, for me, it's like, if I have Acolytes already, and I'm going, and I'm not going for reduced drops through uh, Redemption Brotherhood or Battle Regiment, I'm just going to pick up Wizard Finders along the way, because I value that more than like a Vanguard Battalion or whatever. That's fair. That's fair. It, and it does come in handy. I had a game where uh, six Quester Soulsworn killed Croak in one attack because of Wizard Finders. <laughs> they swung high and did 26 damage and just killed him through Source Guard. It was pretty amazing. All right, so in addition to the new seasonal rules, we also had some core rule changes, which was frankly the most exciting part of everything that's happened. Uh, because unit coherency, instead of starting at six models, now starts at seven. And what that means is... Before, if you had six models, they had to be in two ranks, more or less. Now, that starts at seven models. And there's almost no unit that has seven models, so this is really good for units that had six models to begin with, like Quest or Soulsworn. Or if you had a unit of three models that can now be reinforced, like Dracolines. <laughs> That's been a really big change for a unit like that. Um, it has made Dracolines arguably the best unit in the book. Um, I think you know, most of the lists we're going to be talking about today have a unit of Dracolines, either three or six. And a big part of that is because this unit coherency change has, has made that six viable and it's opened up a lot of new strategies. On the flip side, though, Lookout Sir now prevents shooting unmounted heroes that are more than 12 inches away. So our traditional shooting core of bringing you know, two units of long strikes and just sniping out all enemy heroes at the top of the turn. Unfortunately, we can't do that anymore. Or if you want to teleport them in range or translocate them in range, they're going to die immediately after you do that. Um, so not the best strategy. But it is still possible to do it in a pinch if you need to, for example, drop some crossbow judicators within 12 inches of an enemy hero or tempesters. Their shooting is unaffected by this because they could only shoot 12 inches anyway. Um, but this is this is a pretty significant, uh, I would say, external nerf to Stormcast. It's if we could still shoot heroes, I think we'd be looking a lot better. Uh, but despite that, it also works for us, right? Like we no longer have to care about our heroes getting shot off either, even though they weren't as crucial. It's nice to have them around for most of the game now. And despite that, I'm yeah. still finding myself bringing long strikes. I think they're, and this season in particular, with how spread out armies need to be on these battle plans, I find long strikes with their 30 inch range, even just one unit of three, really, really useful. Just for clearing out screens, taking chunks out of monsters, shoot, helping focus fire units down before you go in to kill something for a battle tactic. 
I find units of three very useful, and sometimes I would even use six as well, as you'll see in these lists today. I do hope, though, that GW kind of, maybe it'll happen to fourth, but does add like some kind of sharpshooter keyword the same way like 40k does. I think that'd yeah. be kind of a, I'd be, I, I think that'd be kind of cool mm -hmm. tech, because then it gives things like a Night Judicator um, like more use. Because I, I think it was Daniel who said it last time, but like he was kind of marketed as like this hero sniper. So I think having something like a sharpshooter um, battalion or something, just to get people away again from the one drop would be really cool in like fourth edition if they had plans for that. Okay. Yeah, or the precision keyword, kind of like how 40k has that for snipers now, that they can just yeah. ignore lookouts, sir. Agreed. Mm. Well, in fourth edition, I hope there's no battle measurement in general. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> I mean, yeah, wouldn't it make some of these like spammy wound armies more balanced? Having to take higher drops is just a consequence of you being cheap as hell. Yeah. Like, I think it, it, I think it'd be a good balancing point, honestly. Yeah. Might be yeah. cool. All right, I think another big change this season is the different battle tactics we have to score. Um, you know, for years now we've been talking about how lousy the Stormcast battle tactics are, and that's only because they were compared to very easy GHB battle tactics. In the monster season, we had very simple ones like kill a battle line unit, you know, like, <laughs> and then and then we had eye for an eye and uh, desecrate and all these very easy tactics for such a long time. We were spoiled, and now it's it's the crunch time. We have a hard time scoring these tactics because they require. Uh, very specific units doing very specific things. And that's just the GHB tactics. Uh, a lot of armies these days are leaning on their faction battle tactics, and Stormcast, unfortunately, don't have the best ones. We don't have the worst ones, right? Like, we're not we're not Skaven over here, but uh, we have we have some, some very situational ones, let's say. Um, with that in mind, we have to start tailoring our list in order to score these battle tactics, because you could still play the usual Stormcast style of, like, you know, be forced to take top of one, survive the double turn, and then just whittle your opponent down and, and kill them over over three or four turns. But you might find yourself just one or two victory points short of a, of a victory. So we really need to lean into these battle tactics, uh, so much so that we even have a separate battle tactic score on all of the lists that we're presenting today. Um, I would say that the ones we need to score in every single game, like these are the top three, you need to do these every single time, no matter what your opponent's doing, you need to do these are Intimidate the Invaders, which requires having more enemies or more allies outside of your territory than in your territory. Surround and Destroy, where you have to have three units on three different battlefield edges, two of which have to be outside your territory. As you can see here, there's a big focus and, on and, and you have to pick those units on the field. Yeah. They can't come in from yeah. reserve. Right, so stuff like teleporting Vanguard Hunters or fast units like Aether Wings. You need cheap, disposable things that don't need to be contesting objectives in the center of the board. Um, that can also later come into the center of the board as needed because you can't just have something sitting on the edge the whole battle. Uh, and the third one I'd say that we need to score every game is Led into the Maelstrom, where a hero and a battle line unit need to charge and at least one of them needs to stay in combat. So these are like, no matter what army your opponent is playing, you have to score these three, I think. Um, then there's the second tier where you probably should score these. Like if you if the opportunity presents itself, you got to go for it. Right, and, and and that's something like Magical Dominance, which requires casting at least one spell and not having any spells unbound. And typically the way you do this is at the top of round one, your opponent forces you to go first. You've deployed a wizard out of their unbinding range. Boom, you score your battle tactic and you move on. Nice, simple turn, right? A lot harder to do when there's enemies in unbinding range because it could just fail because of a random dice roll. Draconith Destruction, that requires destroying a unit with 10 or more models using any Draconith or Star Drake or Dracoth keyword. Um, that's really good with Tempesters right now this season. And if they're battle line Tempesters, well, they also get to score lead into the Maelstrom, which makes that unit very, very useful for battle tactics. The Hammer Strike Force requires destroying any hero with 10 or more wounds that hasn't been wounded. Uh, this is really good. A lot of people are running something like a Bellacore or a Croak or just some kind of monster in their list. And at some point in the game, you just you know, turn on a dime and just point everything at that monster until it's dead. Or if you're facing uh, orcs and they're running the uh, 10 wound hero on Nash Tooth, that's a very easy battle tactic right there. And the last one I'd say that's more situational is a matter of honor. This one requires destroying a monster with a dragon, uh, either a Star Drake or a Draconith, which means Storm Drakes or Karazai or Krondis. This is a lot more situational because your list might not have those units. It's actually, you know, pretty rare to see a, a big Karazai, even though we do have three different Karazai lists to talk about today. <laughs> it's actually still pretty rare to see him on the table. He's not like in every Stormcast list. Um, and not every opponent has a monster for you to kill, even when you do play him. So pretty rare. And then rarely scored, I'd say, 
you know, things like reprisal. If your general has been slain, you destroy the unit that, that destroyed the general. Uh, bait and trap, you have to retreat two units and then charge two different units. These are both a lot more situational, a lot more difficult to do. Uh, endless expropriation requires destroying an enemy bonded to an endless spell, which may not always be the best target. It may not always be possible because it's usually like a foot hero and you can't shoot them anymore because of lookout, sir. And then magical mayhem, which you have to destroy an enemy unit with spells. And Stormcast traditionally are not the best army at dealing damage with spells. Really, the only reason we include this are because of the endless spells and merciless blizzard. Uh, those enable this as a battle tactic. If you want to know more about how to score battle tactics, check out episode number 49, how to score battle tactics. Uh, we go into a pretty, pretty good in-depth detail about each one, how we rank them, uh, units you want to consider including in your list in order to score all of them. It's probably the biggest challenge that any Stormcast player faces this turn, and I highly recommend you watch that video. All right, let's jump into our first list. This is a derivation of the Stormcast beginner competitive list from one of our previous episodes. I used a very similar version of this list, but it had a battle mage in it. And unfortunately, the battle mage is being uh, completely changed and is no pretty much no longer worth using in Stormcast lists. I think uh, Wild Form was too good for this world and it will be missed. Uh, it really was our best wizard. <laughs> yes. Should have be kept it, man. Should have kept it. Just It makes Scions of the Storm so much worse. It makes certain units like Retrobeaters... Fulminators, just protectors. not good at all. My god. And I mean, protectors still have some sort of like annual value, but it's like, my god, did they really not factor mobility into our elite units? Yeah. It's like, they haven't figured out that brutes are b not bad because, you know, they're a bad combat unit. It's because they're not going to get anywhere uh, right. before Gorgrunt is due. Mm -hmm. So they're, they need to think of something. Uh, honestly, yeah, after seeing Seraphon and their artifact or whatever, yeah. The Lord Imperaton should just be able to drop any uh, infantry unit within seven inches. Yeah, that or might just make make that our allegiance ability. Yeah, those are options. Sure. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at the Stormcast beginner competitive list. Um, it starts off with an Antorian Acolytes Battalion using a Knight and Cantor and a Knight Zephyros. Although this Zephyros could be any hero, uh, any wizard hero up to 150 points that fits in this battalion could work. Um, you could take uh, even just like. Any 100-point wizard, Knight Arcanum, another Knight in Cantor, um, up to you. It's a total flex slot. The Knight Relictor is the general here with High Priest and Translocation, and he's in the Wizard Finder's Battalion in order to get plus one attack against wizards, along with six Quester Soulsworn. The reason we suggest using these guys in the beginner list uh, is because they're just versatile. They're a cheap, they're they're a durable screen when you need a good screen. They can teleport themselves after, and after they come in from Deep Strike and contest enemy objectives. Like, they're just a very strong, versatile unit. They fill whatever gap is missing in your in your current list. The Knight Encantor is there to unbind a spell guaranteed once per turn, and the Knight Relictor can also translocate the Knight Encantor forwards. He can cast Merciless Blizzard because he'll be within 12 inches of something. So if there's like a big Mock Russia in the middle of the table and you, you're you worried that you know you can't shoot it down because it's got Finest Hour and Mystic Shield and, and it's about to all that defense, well, a Merciless Blizzard might just get it done for you because they have terrible unbinding usually in Iron Jaws. So that's a very fun combo of uh, filling out a Redemption Brotherhood Battalion, which is all one drop. We've got five Vanquishers, five Vanquishers, four Tempesters. I was just singing the praises of Tempesters earlier. They're so good for battle tactics. They can score Lead into the Maelstrom. They can score Dracman of Destruction. They can score so many tactics. They're very, very useful. Uh, then a smaller shooting core with three Aether Wings and Vanguard Raptors with Long Strike Crossbows. Uh, these guys work really well with Thunderbolt Volley to clear out screens to give room for the big squad of Dragon Cats, the six Evocators on Dracolines they go in and just mess everything up. Uh, so this is a very straightforward Stormcast list. It's a very, like we call this the hammer and anvil style because you, you set your opponent up on the anvil and then your hammer comes in and smashes down on it. Um, this is what we would suggest for people just getting into you know competitive Stormcast play. Um, this has units that you can split into very different lists. Uh, the Knight and Cantor, the Relic Turrets, Impestors, Dracolines, Long Strikes, all these units are great and you'll find yourself using them in a lot of different lists this season. In terms of grand strategy, uh, that's kind of a sticking point this season, and it's kind of an interesting interesting discussion. Uh, the one we picked here is Overshadow, which requires destroying all enemy battle line units and keeping at least one of yours alive. And that can be hard to do with this list because it's only got you know two screens of five Vanquishers and you want those dying generally. Uh, you don't just want to hide one in a corner. You need them in the way of enemy charges like they, and contesting objectives. And then the four block of Tempesters. Um, in my experience... People generally kill the cats before they get to the Tempesters, 
and they usually end up surviving. Uh, once once you lose, you know, two Tempesters, three Tempesters, they're not the biggest threat anymore. Their damage output isn't actually that high. It's just the combination of their shooting and their melee that makes them scary. Um, they're just a very versatile unit. So that once they become less of a threat, your opponent will just ignore them unless they know Overshadow is your battle tactic, and then they'll specifically go after them. So I'm a little torn on grand strategies this season, uh, but given how bad all of them are, I think this is the best choice that, that you could do with this list. You could also do Spellcasting Savant. It's not the best, I agree. And in a lot of cases, they might just target your general and kill him. But at the same time, if you're sort of winning, I, I like it because if you're kind of winning, you can control whether that happens or not. It's not a case of, oh, you won the game, but you lost your grand strategy because you didn't kill all your all their battle line. Or all your battle line is dead for whatever reason, because you, like Stormcast usually does, won a Peric victory. Yeah. Um, so I like... I like spellcasting Savant for that reason. I took that in OBR too because it's like, and in OBR I know it's a little different because you have bodyguards. Like everyone's using bodyguards with a Mortis card, but I think I honestly think that might be up there. Because um, if if you're winning the game and you can control the tempo, I think that is a very doable grand strategy. It, it sure is, especially because almost every Stormcast list will have a Knight and Cantor, who is a good target for that because mm -hmm. you want to take Shaman of the Chilled Lands as the command trait. The problem is, or Arcane Tome. The problem is you give up High Priest. Right, that's yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. Is high yes. priest is such a useful thing, especially if you're using a knight relictor, not a lord relictor. A three plus translocate is not reliable enough on its own. So, if that was the direction that we wanted to go with this list, what I would do, I would make the Zephyros the general with uh, Master of Magic, and then you've got fifty points. Just upgrade the knight relictor to a lord relictor and go with a two thousand point list. Yeah, that, yeah, that's definitely doable. Um, I think I would prefer Shaman of the Chilled Lands. That way you can take a different spell in the Night Encanto. You sure, can take like Lightning whatever. Blast yeah. and just sit sure. back and just whip out yeah, Lightning agreed. Blast every time. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. But in doing that, because the Zephyros has the innate teleport, that gives you a better option to control whether or not the Zephyros can be targeted because you can literally just teleport it to the other side of the table if you have to. Mm -hmm. and, and the Zephyros is probably getting a pretty sick new model soon. <laughs> so yeah, that's... I, I will go ahead. I will I will say I have I do agree with the spellcasting Savant. I've been using it in like all my games. And I think Stormcast has the advantage that we're not our heroes are really getting targeted. I feel like anytime a heroes die, it's more or less like because your opponent your opponent just finds an easy way to do it. Like if they throw, I don't know, like Jaws at like your five inch movement hero, right? Like that doesn't really yeah. cost them really anything. It's just like it's jaws. Um, I feel like that's really the only way our heroes actually die because our hammers are usually so beefed up that they're like they have to deal with that because if you don't deal with that, you're gonna lose this game. And then it hits turn four or five, and your 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 general still alive. And I think that's pretty much how I always been scoring that grand strategy. Again, it's not the best because. Most of our generals are like five to six in five to six wound um, wizard heroes. Um, if you take that grand strategy, so like it kind of feels bad if they get because they could get if they get hit, they're just dead. But overall, I just I really been liking that grand strategy. Yeah, I'm I'm torn on it. Um, I've also considered Baron Icecape, especially if you're playing a significant amount of shooting, where you could just pick out the heroes that have artifacts. A lot of people aren't running multiple artifacts these days. People aren't generally going Warlord for artifacts. It's pretty rare to see that. It's usually like Warlord for a spell enhancement or Warlord um, to get a Holy Command if you're Stormcast. But usually people are just going Acolytes, right? Like that's... Eh, I don't know about yeah. that. You'll fight Soulblight and be very sad if you take that grand strategy. And Soulblight yeah. is really popular right now because Soulblight will easily take extra artifacts and all their heroes can't be shot anymore. So yeah, yeah Except for maybe like a Vampire Lord or like a Nefrata or something. I Zombie think Dragon the... Lord. Yeah, uh, OBR is the same way. Like, trying to kill the Bone Shaper with the key is... Through, through 30 wounds of Immortus Guard? Yeah, right. that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's tough. And then, not only that, you have to also have no enemy units hold within six inches of, so of the, the table. So it's like of the center. two yeah. different conditions have to be met. Um, there's just no other good grand strategies. Yeah. And, and the, even, I think... even looking at the new cities book, I don't think there's enough cities units in there that I would personally want to run that would... Uh, allow me to score the, the grand strategy where you keep two cities units alive. Maybe two gyrocopters and just 
sit them in the corners and do nothing with them all game long. I, I don't know if that's right. Really you don't want to do 30 Fusiliers with a War Forger and Ogre Major as a coalition? You don't <laughs> no, like that? because they're static. <laughs> <laughs> they can't move. That's why they have 30 inch range. Uh, if you roll, if you roll the six, it, no, you get twenty-seven. If you get the artifact, right? It's it's twenty-four. No, no, no I'm saying plus like D6. assuming three on an average. If you take a, if you roll a one on the fusilier major, yeah, that feels bad, buddy. You know, you know, yeah. D six means one. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I roll sevens all the time on annihilators. <laughs> so I have to. I, every discussion about dice that we do, I have to approach from that angle. <laughs> well, I guess I don't fail every charge, so it's possible. Come on, Paul. You and I are in good company. <laughs> all right jack let's talk about your list here they're all over us i also classify this as a hammer and anvil kind of list mostly because it doesn't really seem like any other kind of list <laughs> it's just that's that's fair yeah so, um, so tell us all about it man is this the one you ran to uh to, to good success at a tournament it was okay I'll uh let you tell me. it's a slight this is a slight variation um the basic list that i went for one at boise with is based on this foundation um and then i went three two at um uh, e uh emerald city open three last weekend and it was it, it played fine um the idea with this list is to score five battle tactics every game and more often than not, deny my opponent their grand strategy while scoring my grand strategy and just being all over the place, forcing my opponent to constantly chase me around the table in an effort to try to stop me from tagging objectives and scoring battle tactics. Yeah, um, and it seems like you've still got enough damage here with the translocate into a blizzard. You've got the dim pesters and dracolines. Like, you've got enough damage that the opponent can't just, like, body you off objectives. But at the same time, you're just like, everything's teleporting around constantly. It's got to be the most frustrating thing to play against. It is. It, it's it's really fun to play. Um, and it's and for the most part, it's fun to play against because it forces you to think about what you're doing when you come up against this list. Uh, a lot of people, I have to explain what Stormkeep does because no <laughs> one's ever played against it before. Um, so the list can, uh, is very hero heavy. It has six heroes. It is a Knight and Cantor with Celestial Blades and Horfrost. That's my buff in Cantor. Um, that one follows the evocators around the table and keeps them buffed up. It has a Knight and Cantor with Lightning Blast and Merciless Blizzard that I refer to as my Blast in Cantor. It does exactly what it says on the tin. It throws the, uh, mortal wounds out and is annoying. Um, it has a Battle Mage with Hoarfrost and Rupture. Uh, yes, we've talked about uh, wild form changing and going away when the new cities book comes out i am still considering bringing a battle mage because they are still plus one to cast which makes it much better than most of our stormcast wizards i have the knight relictor as my general with high priest and translocation i've got a knight zephyros with lux stone that is the artifact that allows a stormcast player to instead of rolling dice just declare the result she is there to score me uh, surround and destroy, and let into the maelstrom. And so that I don't have to roll dice, it just happens. And then I have a an assassin and 10 shadow warriors. And that is how I score the uh, grand strategy sacred charge. They stay in reserve until turn three, and then I drop them somewhere on the table my opponent can't get to. Uh, I've got two units of Vanguard Hunters as battle line, a unit of Liberators to benefit from the Stormkeep ability, call for aid to bring the Liberators back, and then four Tempesters and six Evocators on Dracolines. The Endless spell that's currently in there, Deus Arcanum, I have been playing around with different Endless spells. Uh, I've tried uh, Gravetide, I've tried Maelstrom, um, and most of them either never get cast or never do enough to be worth bringing. So I'm bringing Deus this time so that my Knight and Cantor has an easier chance staying with my Evocators as they move around the table. Um, and that's literally how the list works. They the units teleport around the table, score objectives, score battle attacks, force my opponent to move where I want them to move, while my Tempesters and Evocators get into position to then deal a death blow. This is like the opposite of everything we were talking about just before we got to this list. Like, 
almost mm-hmm. everything we've discussed here um, <laughs> with like, you know, people don't want to bring in Acolytes and Warlord. It's one or the other people uh, like you just broke all these rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and that's OK. Uh, the first question I want to ask you, obviously, is, you know, a lot of this stuff's going away when the new cities book comes out. Assassins are still in the sure. game. Battle mages are still sure. in the game, but they function completely differently. Correct. Shadow Warriors are gone. Um, do you still want to keep that same style? Would you bring other cities units? And if so, what would you consider? Uh, I am tearing through the leaked Cities of Sigmar book, trying to come up with something. My initial instinct was to take Galen and Duralia Van Denst and Hexel's uh, Hexblades, because they all have a ward save, and I can just leave them as a little pocket. The problem is, is that Galen and Duralia are two separate leaders, even though you buy them together, and I just don't have enough leader slots. Um, I've considered bringing two uh, Dark Riders. Um, I think Dark Riders are awesome. The ability to deny my opponent's uh, commands is fantastic. Um, I haven't quite decided. I will probably stick with this foundation and then see if I can find Cities of Sigmar units to fit in rather than pivoting to something like Spellcasting Savant or Overshadow. I think I got the pick for you. Are you ready for this? Shoot. The Command Core. Because the Whisper Blade <laughs> wins the game on a 4-up every turn. Uh, I... I, I am seriously looking at that. I have actually started trying to put together like a uh, the uh, what's the 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 marshal and then the command core together. Um, my only problem right now is that most of the stuff that I have looked at, it's it's too targetable. It's too easy to find. Um, and so I'm I'm trying to see. I've also looked at a sorceress and a unit of dread spears. The getting the ability to have a plus two spellcasting wizard for what's uh, with you know a bunch of extra wounds. Um, I I don't know. I I'm 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 I will absolutely let you know when I make my decision because I haven't quite figured out what the sauce is going to be yet. Okay, I'm excited to find out. Do you think you'd ever consider running Steadfast March here instead of Call for Aid, or is the extra revived Liberators just too useful? Um, I have seriously looked at it. Um, I have two different versions of this list for the next GT. One of them takes Spell Enhancement for the extra spells, and one of them takes uh, Steadfast March for the run and charge on the Dracolines. Um, I think that decision is really going to come down to whether or not the city's book goes live before that tournament. If it doesn't, I will probably take Steadfast March. Okay. Right on. It's a cool list, man. Looking forward to hearing how you play it again. Thanks. All right. Up next here, we have Tempesting Dragons. This is the only dedicated Storm Drake list that we have in our video today. Uh, and this was brought to us by John. So, John, take it away. Let us know why you built the list the way you did. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is a new sort of GHB variation on the list that I've been playing now <clears throat> since around February or March. And I've found some pretty decent success with, um, you know, it's the classic Gardas, Castellan, Stormdrake Guard. Um, the, the value that they still have um, in this GHB, uh, I think, is still massive. The Stormdrake Guard have the um, spell ignore, which, um, you know, works half of the time, uh, but is, is, is very strong. And actually the, the, the better part of it is it makes your enemy, your opponent second guess, uh, casting spells against them. So you can get closer to them and they're not necessarily going to try uh, like waste that blizzard spell on you or waste, you know, some other spell on you. So it's a bit more of a, deflection detraction than anything else um the safe stacking obviously with lord castellan i found that that 18 inch plus one to save can be so crucial on any single unit that you have at any point um he does have the arcane tome so you can also do a mystic shield uh but having the 18 inch on his uh lantern is is just really 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 good and also, um, he has the uh, D3 Mortal Wounds option as well, 
I think it's on a two up uh, that I find I, I do use almost once a game at some point when I just want to take some wounds down on an enemy. That 18 inch range is, is, is just really solid. Um, so, you know, he is, in my opinion, like does, does a lot and, and is worth his, you know, relatively expensive cost. And then, of course, you know, Gardas, he went down a little bit in points, but I was still running him before. Um, the ward is something that I think people still sort of underestimate. And now with the lookout sir rules, it is a lot easier to have him safe from being targeted and sniped off. Obviously, he can be targeted with magic, but that ward really helps with big damage coming in. You know, I've been played a game recently where I actually did get blizzarded twice on my Storm Drake guard. One time for 14 wounds, the other time for 12. And, you know, shrugged almost half of them with that 5-up ward. Um, so it can be very critical. Um, it can be used for basically anywhere that you, you castle. And the fact that, you know, you can keep them in reserve and drop them down where you need him, where you want him, where you're going to build your castle um, is, is a really solid aspect. And, and it's almost like the designers had that in mind when, when they modeled him, right? Um, so, that, so that's really interesting. So, you know, obviously, like, the community um, and lots of people uh, on the Stormkeep team have been talking about, you know, the, the Gardas Castle and Storm Drake list for, for quite some time. And then there's always this idea of like, you know, what goes with them? Like what other hammers are you going to bring with them? What other utility are you going to bring with them? And I think that's where, um, you know, people have tried various things back in the day. There was, you know, a lot more dragons coming <laughs> I think um, there's a lot of uh, cats coming as well now. People would sometimes run them with other things. But I have found the most success from running them with four Tempesters. Uh, Tempesters are like one of the most incredible utility units. Um, I think you guys rated them an S finally. Uh, yep. <laughs> I felt that way about them. Yeah, I felt that way about them last season too. Being able to drop them in... Uh, within nine and getting those shots off, uh, usually with an all-out attack potentially, but just getting those those mortal wounds through and those shots off, and then kind of sitting there and just being like, all right, well, and next time you charge into me, I'm going to unleash hell for like 12 more wounds or 14 more wounds. They're just, you know, really, really solid. Um, I play them in a list that's 1980 points, and I've been doing this like for one particular reason, and that's that I find using and relying on the Triumph Inspired can give Tempesters for, for one turn uh, almost as much kind of threat and damage as like, you know, um, Evocators on Drac Leads or maybe like a, like a Fulminator unit. Like obviously not as much, but it really, once you get them down with an all-out attack to being on twos and threes for those swords and then twos and twos for their mounts, they can do so much uh, damage. So I've found that that's been a really good combo. And then also using sometimes Inspired on their shooting, uh, occasionally if I really need to get rid of something. Um, I then, you know, facing this sort of battle line tax that you need to take with Gardas, I do take a single unit of Judicators with Bolt, Bolt Storm Crossbows, which... I think a lot of people maybe sometimes sleep on just having that five unit. Um, they do a lot of work for me. And what I find is if the opponent I'm playing, like I always keep them up in the sky with the tempo pesters. And if the opponent has left something that's important, like a, a monster, uh, like obviously not an 18 wound monster, but maybe like a 14 wound monster, like Bellacor is a great example. Like I did this on that season's board game. Um, that uh, that I participated in, where like if you drop the tempesters and then the judicators behind them, you can with those two units attack shooting alone, you can take out some very significant um, like high damage um, monsters or, or or big units. So I find having that option to be like a really nice kind of combo hammer. And then those tempe and then those judicators are so far behind the tempesters, like the enemy's really gonna have to get through the tempesters before 
uh, they're ever going to get to that adjudicator. So it sort of like sets them in a nice spot. And and so that core I've been playing with for for a really long time, except I had an encanter that I was bringing along with it. And as I was talking about earlier and like list building around this new GHB, um, I decided that I really needed to bring something that would potentially open up uh, a bit more of uh, the battle tactics. So I ended up going with a Lord Arc- Arcanum on Drift Charger. Um, he has a lot of things um, that really plays into to this season. Um, obviously, one of the things is a teleport. Like That's incredible to have. Uh, surround and destroy, it's really crucial. But I've also found, um, you know, giving him, uh, be- being the general, giving him Shaman, having uh, the grand strategy be spellcasting Savant, like, he's going to survive. It's going to be very difficult for anybody to take him out, even if they get into combat with him. You know, you can uh, save stack on him, or maybe you did finest hour, and then in the next turn, you're just teleporting out of there. He's eight wounds. It's going to be very difficult for someone to to get him down, but he's also got a 12 inch movement. And so, um, you know, doing the uh, battle tactic when you're charging in a hero and and one of your battle line units, I, I found I was often struggling with that battle tactic, which is relatively easy to get. Um, but I was struggling because I never wanted to charge Gardison, and the Castellan is a bit slow. Like it, he's always kind of bringing up the rear. Um, and quite frankly, if he didn't have an 18 inch on his uh, lantern, it, he probably wouldn't be an auto bring for this list. But he's often too far away to really get that battle tactic. So I found that the Griff Charger Lord, I'm happy to charge in um, and to get that battle tactic. Uh, because I'll just teleport him out after if I have to. And then, you know, being that he uh, brings along Shaman, like before I was running this list with the Lord Castellan as general, but now I can bring Shaman along, I get the three spells. That opens up some really interesting battle tactics. Like, you know, I could do uh, Magical Mayhem if I decide to use Blizzard. Let's say I have three Primal Dice, right? That's a pretty reasonable chance. Uh, he's got Scintillating Trail uh, as his mount trait, so that's going to help out with, with casting as well, which I didn't have before. And, and I, actually today in a game I played helped out twice. Like that extra one on top um, for the, the Unbind is, is a lot. It's significant. It's, it's, it's sort of like a plus one. Um, and then, but then it also gives them things like, you know, you could... Like, Horfrost is great, whatever, 12-inch range, it's fine, it, it can be fun. Throwing Rend 3 onto the Storm Drake Guard swords is ridiculous, and, and is a combo I did do in one game, and it was incredible. Um, but also, even, like, Rupture, like, there's that battle tactic that you need to uh, make an endless spell go wild or kill the wizard. Having Rupture gives you two ways to get that battle tactic, not just one. So you can you can call the battle tactic out and maybe say like, oh, I'm going to try and kill your wizard. And maybe they forget to dispel their endless spell, right? And now you're using Rupture first to try and make it go wild because that'll give you the battle tactic. And then you're trying to go in and kill the wizard. So you're getting two chances of that. Yeah, you, you um, may also bait out a finest hour if you do that, right? Like if if you declared exactly. uh, like Arcan as the target after he casts a, a Maelstrom oh. or something. Uh, well, Maelstrom's not a right, not the right one because they're going to dispel that no matter what. <laughs> but let's say, uh, like a pendulum or something, sure. right? They don't, they don't see the play and they yeah. don't dispel their own pendulum. You call Arcan, he goes, "Oh, okay, finest hour, right?" And it's like, "Oh, well, good news. I wasn't trying to kill you. I was just trying to rupture your spell." Exactly, exactly. So it gives you the bit of mind games, uh, which you always want. But but just you know, to be honest, the first few games I played of this GHB, I was losing by two points, three points, and now that I've adjusted um, not only my grand strategy because I was doing Overshadow before, and I'll tell you, like, Spellcasting Spawn is incredible with an eight wound teleporting, you know, wizard that has a heal spell as well. I forgot to mention his heal spell. Um, the heal spell actually synergizes really well with the Storm Drake Guard as well because they have so many wounds, you know, they'll often be at, like, three or four. And so, you know, being able to give them uh, a D3 or a D6 pump up can go a really, really long way. 
Um, so yeah, this list is really uh, a modification on on the Dragon's Guard is Castle list that that you know we've been having success with for a while, but adjusts it to the current GHB in a way that I'm finding I, I now have you know like seven battle tactics I can kind of do like if you include our our own book ones as well. So um, yeah, I'm excited about this and I'll be playing this at Nova next weekend. Although I still have an hour to decide if I'm going to change out Thundershock for Celestial <laughs> Blade. <laughs> it's it's uh, an interesting one. What do one. you guys think? What I do think you, you should take Horfrost. Well, I have it. So he has it because he's Shaman. Oh, he's Shaman. Oh, okay. In that case, I would take Thundershock. I think I'm minus one to That's how I'm feeling too, but way more I'm useful. torn about it. No, no, I think... I think cause so because if you need to cover Horfrost and cover any wound deficiencies you might have, but um, I there's, think Thundershock is... There's going to be situations where he's your locus focus, because you, you don't have to be unma unmounted mm -hmm. to be the locus focus, right? So he could cast yes. two spells, and he could Horfrost and Celestial Blades. Um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> for just max Storm Drake damage. That, and that could help, right? Because like one of the problems with Storm Drakes is they're low max damage, so the more you can pump their accuracy, the better they get. So like Ren three mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. twos and twos is about as good as you can get. That would be insane. Yeah, it's not. Actually, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think I think Celestial Blades might be the play here then because if I think about it, the top three armies are Soulblight Grave Lords, Osterbone Reapers with Null Myriad, so they don't give a shit about you know Thundershock, and then True. your Slanesh Spam, which is, I guess they might care, but because they'll be winning on fours, but they have so many shots that like they don't really care. Um, corn might, but like again, they they again they might not even care because they like, they just depend on doing mortal wounds on hit rolls and doing a bunch of blood type movement stuff. Yeah, so I think exactly. celestial blades. I think Paul's right. I think you go celestial blades and then hoarfrost because if you can get either one off, you can buff up wound rolls and the rend rolls. In in most situations, celestial blades will increase storm drake guard damage more than bumping their their swords from rend to rend three, right? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And Horfrost is a harder cast. So, like, let's say you want to save your primal dice, you just want to get an easy blades off, or like you're trying to do um, celestial or magical dominance, right? It's like, okay, Mystic Shield, yeah. Celestial Blades, then I move up. So, and it's 18 inches. If you had like a translocate, if you could teleport in the hero phase rather than, you know, doing it a turn ahead, I would go with Thundershock because Thundershock is good. Like, minus right. one to wound is very good, especially into. You know, new cities, Slanesh, like these armies that are wounding on threes and fours that or, or wounding on fours. Tight, and get, yeah, they're, packed. Yeah. they're they're wounding on fours and they get plus one, so they're on threes. But taking them back to fours is a huge damage debuff for them. Um, Coalesce hates actually, it. Actually, you know what? <laughs> it's, it's really good. You know what? You know what? Actually, I'm going to use your guys' uh, beautiful little chart here. Let's look at that for a sec. The defensive, like I can't get more defensive with this thing, so I don't really need Thundershock. <laughs> Like yeah. it is an interesting way to look at this, you know what I mean? Yeah, you need to. The thing is, you're already tar pitting, kind of playing like a tar pit style list with Storm Regard as it is. Yeah, and um, I never lose. Thundershot, oh. Thundershot could be valuable if you were tar pitting elite units, like you know. But most of the time, stuff that is really good in the game now is just gonna die, and the stuff that is elite has a two of swelling door. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So celestial blaze well, we would go. Be play here. Yeah, there we go. Sweet. Well, this is this is a good modification on a, on an old chestnut. Um, it plays well. Like I, I enjoyed our game with it, even though I was playing a dirty Kronspine list. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, that was fun. It, it was fun, yeah. So uh, it's good to see this list still has legs. Oh yeah, I, I won today by one point, and on Wednesday I won by one point. It's uh, it's getting me there. It's getting me there. But one point, all you need. That, I was it, by, one by point's all you points. need, man. Yeah, exactly. Just, yeah. How do you guys feel about Storm Drakes this season in general? I still feel like they're really up there, like a, like a tier, a plus tier. I think if they like they went down like twenty or forty points, they'd be perfect. They'd be back to where they're supposed to be. Yeah. I think what just the biggest thing that feels bad is because they're supposed to be a really good anvil that could punch you back. But that anvil is chipping away because everything is neg two, neg three, two, three damage right. in this game now. Yeah, uh, I, I, and I, or mortal wounds uh, at the butt, or mortal that wounds, too. and that's that's where I'm at with them. Um, I think that when they came out and they had all of their abilities, 
340 felt perfectly fine um, because they did a lot. And at that time, the game was not in a place where they would just die on an attack. Now, you have to, you're, you're literally investing an additional four, 300 and some odd points just to keep, try to keep them alive. And that doesn't feel good. I think that with their current war scroll, they should be no more than 300 or 310. Yeah. 300 feels about right. Honestly, they could be 280 even at this point. Um, yeah. They were in this like neat slot where they would like slot into your army when you had 300 points remaining. Like 340 is a very awkward spot because yeah. it, it's like most of the times when I build Starcast list, I end up in a very like 280, 300 point dilemma where I need to take like a, I'm thinking like, okay, I'll take a Fulminator and like maybe an endless spell. But the choice to take a Storm Day Guard there would actually not be a bad one. But 340 is just too much and it makes me having to always build around them. Yeah, and, and without defensive buffs, only two of them, they, they die really quick these days. Right, they, that used to feel a lot tankier before every army had Ren two, Ren three, uh, shutting off wards, shutting off commands. Uh, these 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 things used to be rare. Now they're way more common, and two storm drakes just don't live long long enough. Yeah. Now let's talk about Golden Tempest. So this is a list uh, that I built, I think, last season, and the main core of the list was six Tempesters, and then I paired it with like a Lore Seeker in order to drop a Purple Sun into play to give them effectively. Uh, an extra point of Ren there. And then I would stack Geminids on top of that to disable all that defense. And that all felt pretty good. Uh, and that, you know, a lot of that list got a lot cheaper because you could run a Knight Relictor now instead of a Lord Relictor. Uh, you can run all sorts of other cheaper stuff. And then Tempesters got a bit cheaper and now they're more useful than ever. So I thought, hey, let's let's build that list for this season, right? And what would that look like? It's definitely a shoot cast list, I think, when you run uh, six Tempesters, <laughs> you buff them up with a Lord Castellant, then you translocate them into the middle of the board. You pass your charge, great. If you fail your charge, doesn't matter because your opponent has to deal with the Tempesters. They can't just let them sit there in the middle of the board shooting every single turn. Um, and when they try to deal with them, they're going to be trying to cut through 36 wounds with plus two to saves usually, sometimes plus three if you get the Mystic Shield off, um, backed up by long strikes, targeting key pieces, and Dracolines flanking things on the side. Um, that's pretty much the list. It, it's very straightforward. Uh, the reason I would even give it a three in complexity is just because knowing how to commit those Tempesters makes or breaks the whole game. right? If yeah. you don't shoot the right targets, if you don't position correctly, if you don't get in the right charge lanes, if you don't, um, for example, in some cases, you'll even be dropping Liberator screens in front of them. And if you don't do that properly, uh, the game can just end right? if you don't know exactly mm -hmm. how to commit. Uh, otherwise, though, it's pretty straightforward. It, it does what it does. Um, it's a bit lacking in some battle tactics, right? Like it's gonna it's gonna struggle to do surround and destroy. It does have liberators in there and aether wings and a knight relictor with high priest, so those things help. Uh, it's got the big block of tempesters for dragon and destruction and led into the maelstrom, um, but it's gonna struggle with other things on some maps. Like I would say, intimidate the invaders might be difficult for this list because you've got extra units of shooting hanging out in the back. Liberators are slow. Three foot heroes are slow. Um, but overall, I feel I feel pretty good about this one. I think it's going to be the next one that I go into serious playtesting with. Uh, one of the options I had already considered was maybe maybe six rank, uh, maybe six long strikes are too much. So I was thinking I could swap three long strikes for two fulminators. You know, they fill an extra battle line slot, so you could swap out five liberators for griff hounds or uh, hunters of Huanchi with bolas could be another possible option. Uh, some kind of extra screen that is also good at scoring battle tactics or vanguard hunters, right? Something like that. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you've got the points uh, and are looking for something that can fill that role, the tree revenants are also excellent. Another like 100, 110 point unit that has a built in teleport, um, can be repositioned once the tempesters move up without committing the night relictors translocate. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, I really dig this. I Everyone knows I am in love with Tempesters. They are in every list I make. Um, running six like tickles something in my soul that I desperately want to try. Pa and I like what you're doing with them. Um, dropping them in, shooting, or like buffing them up, translocating them in, shooting with them, and standing in the opponent's way and daring them to yeah. take the Unleash Hell from them. <laughs> You, you haven't lived until you've rolled a six Tempester Unleash Hell. It just, I've I've killed 10 Chosen on the charge with it, and it's just felt so good. It's, yeah. it's really unreal. 
I I love it when my four tempesters pop off with unleash hell. I couldn't imagine what six looks like. It feels pretty damn good. <laughs> it feels really good. Um, so you know you've you've got the encanter there to stop things like geminids disabling commands, um, but you can't really do anything if they charge you with morgast archai or. Uh, like a, a, a contorted epitome, these things that just shut off commands in general. So you might want to watch out for that. And um, that's why I recommend dropping liberator screens in front. Sometimes they can they can be enough distance that um, they can't finish a charge within three inches, you know, depending on how everything's set up. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a pretty fun list, I think. I played it quite a bit last season and I'm looking forward to trying it again. If you have six Dracoths that are magnetized, hopefully, um, or eight in this case, if you if you run the Fulminators too, uh, I guess I should talk about those two Fulminators, because we haven't really talked about Fulminators yet on this episode. Um, I think Fulminators are gone from that, you know, reinforced block unit that just charges up the middle of the board and murders everything in its path. And then if you're like if, like my opponents, they just stick them in combat the rest of the game and they never charge again. Um, yeah. And that's always been a downside. That's that's a bigger downside this season than ever before, because uh, you need them charging. I think the damage output needed in the game now to deal with armies like OBR and soul blight you just have to be charging every turn and that makes me just want to use draculines instead so why would i want two fulminators well it's a second unit to score battle tactics it's battle line which means you can score lead into the maelstrom and you can also score draculines destruction off it uh, sometimes you don't want to shoot the thing that has 10 models just to score a tactic like those six tempesters they want to put their damage into something more meaningful and uh, you don't want to split and risk losing the battle tactic right like it's just too important this season to make every battle tactic count uh, so the two Fulminators would, would go in there as like a side hammer alongside the, the Draculines. Have you guys thought about using uh, just squads of two Fulminators in your list? I honestly, I've just been... If I'm going to have two Fulminators, I really just like the three Evil Cats. But I could see a two man Fulminators being good if I already had three Evil Cats because I don't... I can't cast in power anymore. So just, does it just fail on you? Yeah, pr- pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like oh, at least Fulminator's like, okay, if I charge something, I get the max damage. Yeah, I, I've i I've seriously thought about it, Paul. Um, right now, I can't fit it in my list. Um, but I have absolutely thought about it. And I think you're right. I think the days of the four-pack Fulminator's charging are, are a thing of the past. Um, armies have gotten to the point now where the four pack of fulminators and uh gore gruntas and stuff like that have been around long enough that people have figured out how to effectively screen and there's enough stuff in the game that can just either eat that charge or um if you if you fail the charge which is why i stopped running them because i failed way more charges than i needed to and then they just don't do enough um, no, but, Gorkart is no, no. So Gorkart is the difference is Gorkart does have tempo. They're right. The fact that you can hit something, clear it, and then if your opponent doesn't have anything within three, well, congratulations, you just get to move nine inches back. Yeah. So you know you get to charge again, or you get to move again, or you get to, and and I think that really makes the difference. The Gorkarters aren't also tied to the charge for their damage. Fulminators are, but meaning if right. they get stuck, you have lost that unit of Fulminators effectively. <sighs> I I um, absolutely agree with you. I but yeah. what what we're seeing. So, so we're what I'm not... saying is like fulminators. You you very much need tempo on your side. I think as like the meta develops and like more books come out, and fulminators unfortunately aren't built for a tempo meta. Yes, one hundred percent. I agree with you. The, the four block certainly isn't, but a two block. Yeah. Okay. I can see it. I, I've I've tried it a few times. I had it in a battle report I did. Um, Stormcast versus Stormcast. I had it in my matchup against James, and it felt good. Honestly. Maybe they could come down a bit in points, though. <laughs> Maybe they I could be a meaningful differentiation. Like two thirty was fine for them. I don't know, like who complained so much about problems they got increases with forty. I think compared to Evocators, two thirty was fine. These days they could be two twenty. If a Mortis Guard could be two twenty, two Fulminators could be two twenty. Well, but I don't think they're gonna. I don't think a Mortis Guard are gonna stay at two twenty. Um, well, that's a different problem, right? <laughs> right. However, the great thing about this is, is that. If you are only using two, it is still enough of a threat for your opponent to have to deal with without being an overcommitment of resources on your part. 
Yeah, that's that's what I like about it. Dracolines kind of do the same thing. Dracolines typically do it better, right? Because they're faster, they have the mortal wounds, they buff, they unbind. Um, they typically do that same role better, but you can just run both. And if you have enough shooting, having minimal damage melee hammers is okay. It's not like the, the worst thing in the world. Could also just run questers here instead of the one unit of Vanguard Raptors. Swap it straight one-to-one -one for questers. Yeah, uh, That could also work. Fair. All right, let's talk about the seven inch Scions Annihilana Grande style, right? Now, the Annihilana Grande list, that uh, we've been talking about that one for a long time, and we kind of put it on the shelf last season because it just felt inefficient, um, risky. Like, there's, it's always been risky, right? If a Grand Hammer fails a charge, oh boy, that's bad. That's a big loss of tempo. So, we always try to minimize that, that loss of tempo. And Quest War Soul Sworn, along with the point changes that happened, have completely revitalized this playstyle, I think. Um, I'm not sure if Knight's Excelsior is the way to go, and that's like the OG and Ilana Grande list is the Knight's Excelsior list. Um, but I've got a couple of variants here that I think are are pretty fun. This first one here is more of a fun list. The other one uh, we'll talk about is more of a competitive list. Uh, this first one here is called Nuclear Launch Detected because, <laughs> <laughs> because you're trying to drop... Annihilators with Grand Hammers, two units of Long Strike Crossbows, the Everblaze Comet, and the Maelstrom all on your opponent's face in round one. And then in round two, you've got another squad of Meteor Grand Hammers coming in. Uh, so this is a very finesse list where you play super defensively, very far away from your opponent, uh, staying completely out of their threat ranges because everything in list just dies. Like it has a defense of one, and that's because if anything in this list takes damage, it just dies. Like everything falls over. Except for the questers, they're decent, but it's not enough. Uh, so the core of the list is a Knight Relictor translocating a Knight Encantor for Blizzard anytime you want. Lord of Periton obviously is needed to make the 7-inch drop work. He's got the Arcane Tome just for more value. It's got the Antorian Acolytes, so fishing for extra Acolyte dice in order to, or Primal dice in order to cast that Merciless Blizzard. Uh, there's nothing really you want to cast uh, Mystic Shield on, like maybe you leave Quest or Soul Sworn on the table and then... Lord Imperitant casts the Mystic Shield on them. Uh, usually what you're doing with your two wizards is you're casting the Everblaze Comet and the Malevolent Maelstrom. Uh, Comet in particular, even though it's 90 points and I don't, I don't like how inefficient it is, it is a high impact spell. Being able to cast it out of unbinding range turn after turn after turn. And if your opponent wants to cast without the minus one, they have to dispel it themselves, which is great. That's one less cast. They're, they, that's like automatically unbinding a spell, right? That's like having a second dispel scroll every single turn. Uh, or they just deal with the minus one to cast, in which case all of your unbinding is a lot easier. So you pop heroic uh, willpower with the Knight Relictor. You've got three unbinds, sometimes four in this list, which which is pretty nice. Um, core of the list, like I said, is is two drops of Grand Hammers and a potential third drop of, of Quester Soul Sworn. What I like about the Questers is that they add a new dimension to drop lists. Instead of just having Grand Hammers that just do a ton of damage, only count as three models, and then die... And that's useful, right? Your opponent spends time cleaning up the Grand Hammers. You can shoot more. That's good. That's good. Uh, they've always had this problem where they just don't contest objectives unless they fully wipe out the unit they're fighting. And if they mm -hmm. take any losses on the way in to like a stomp or an unleash hell or even just you don't fully wipe the unit and then it hits you back, that becomes like really, really hard to do. Um, and the questers are like the opposite of the Grand Hammers. They are 18 wounds or 18 wounds and they count as 18 models on enemy, on, on objectives outside your territory. Um and after they drop, you know, unlike Grand Hammers, which just sit in that, you know, within four inches of wherever they dropped, Questers can teleport away and be useful somewhere else immediately. So they're an awesome unit for this style, and I think they really help round out this list. Otherwise, it would just be, like, all in. <laughs> it would be fun, but I don't think it would be a very, very serious list. Um, but with the Questers yeah. here, I think it takes it to the next level. Yeah, see, they help you shore up that uh, weakness that this list normally has, which is it can't take objectives unless it's trading uh efficiently with uh, opponents and a lot of times that's not going to happen you know bad dice twos and twos is good but bad dice is still a bad dice so yeah yeah the, the, I, i'm not a fan of uh the previous grand hammer list where you fail that seven up charge and it's like oh boy the game's going to be a lot tougher from this point forward if you fail yep. the charge with the questers there's still a ton of wounds that your opponent has to deal with because they do good damage next turn uh they also just count as a lot of models too so if they're trying to push you off an objective and the threat of the teleport keeps them relevant like it really does save this whole archetype, I think. Now, I don't recommend playing this for beginners. I know that the Lord Imperitant comes in the Dominion box. Uh, it seems like it should be a good thing for beginners, but it is not. It is not easy to play. You have to know exactly what your opponent's trying to do. 
uh, how much damage they can do, how far away they can do it from, and just avoid all of it, <laughs> and just keep pinging away, scoring battle tactics with Vanguard Hunters teleporting onto sides, uh, knowing when to drop which unit and, and how where to drop it and what angles to take and which screens to shoot out of the way in order to facilitate it. It's a hard list to play. This is a very difficult yeah. style. It's it's positioning is extremely key and you know two small mistakes can really like cost you either on points or kills or and it's you know you know this is one of the times where um this is gonna sound weird so before this season's battalions I was always going warlord and going for more enhancements because I didn't really care about being a one drop um, I think with Antorian acolytes now being in my opinion worth it more to Stormcast than an extra enhancement. I think a 3-drop is a really... I mean, I know Paul didn't do 3-drop here, but I think a 3-drop is a really sweet spot for this army. It allows you to odd-drop a lot of things, and getting a double with Annihilators feels so good. Oh, yeah, it's it's um, like oppressively it's just, strong. It's really good. Yeah, it is insane amounts of value. So, yes, I would highly, highly recommend a 3-drop with this army now. I don't know if we can manage a 3-drop. I think the best we could do is a 4-drop, just because there's so many units with this particular version of it, right? Um, but I want let's, let's talk about Wizard Finders here, right? Uh, infantry can go into this. Annihilators with plus 1 attack are pretty sweet. Questers with plus 1 attack are pretty sweet. But the question is, how many units are worth attacking with this, right? Uh, in my experience, most of the games I play around my area, I get value out of Wizard Finders. There's like Lord Croaks or, or Zombie Dragons or... Um, Arcans or Stone Horns with Arcane Tomes or a Gargant with an Arcane Tome. There's just usually a big wizard that I want to hit. And sometimes you play into Stormcast and they're using, like we're all using Draculines, right? So uh, plus right. one attack into Draculines is just phenomenal on Grand Hammers. Um, unless they're unless they're strike first Draculines, in which case you stay the heck away. <laughs> uh, but I, I find value in Wizard Finders. I've... With this style in particular, I, I think I'd even drop the Redemption Brotherhood. I'm not too worried about having 7 drops or having like 13 drops. Because uh, this list can play top of 1 easy. It can survive a double because it can stay as far away as it needs to. And it can if, if you're forced to go second, it's got enough screens to to handle like any kind of early aggression. It's got the Dispel Scroll from the Encanter to handle uh, like a Vassal cast teleporting forward or a Spell Portal or some stupid thing. Um, it's got options to play top of 1 or 2. I, the only reason I take the Redemption Brotherhood here is because I really want to make sure I go under these greedy croak lists that, you know, they get 10, 11 drops. I want to make sure I'm always under that because I can never survive a croak double turn with this list. If croak teleports forward and then wins a dice roll, the game's over. So I can never let that happen. And that's why I, I feel like I need to take the Redemption Brotherhood here just to, just to get under that one list. So here's a second uh, Scions list. I called this one Drop the Hammer because it's Hammers with Sigmar using, using drops. Uh, this one's, I would say, more competitive. It's more focused on trying to score battle tactics and play a more standard game while integrating the uh, Grand Hammer package into it. So it's still got the Encanter, Imperitant, Relictor combo. In this case, I don't have High Priest, so it's just a 3-plus translocation. It's terrible, right? But, you know, I played most of 2nd Edition with a 3-up translocation. I think I can get used to it again. Uh, the Knight Encantor here becomes the General. He's got Lightning Blast, and I'm taking Spellcasting Savant. And the Lightning Blast is just going to ping everything for D3 Mortal Wounds until I pass a translocation, and then I can Merciless Blizzard something off the table with a bunch of Primal Dice, <laughs> which is going to feel good. Um, instead of having three drops, like two Grand Hammers and six Questers, this goes for Grand Hammers, Questers, and an optional third drop of Vanquishers. Right? Sometimes you, know, you want to put three units in reserve, play more defensively, play further back, and in that case, you can just drop Vanquishers seven inches away and then drop Tempesters behind them if you want to. Uh, really do a good job clearing out all the screens for a turn, opening up the space for a round two Grand Hammer drop or a Quester drop, and the whole time you're pinging them off with Tempesters and, and Long Strikes. So I think this one's a bit more competitive. The other one's more fun-focused. Um, this one leans into more, you know, the typical units you'd see in lists these days, Tempesters and Dracolines and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have the Vanguard Hunters, which is sad. Uh, it makes scoring uh, Surrounded Destroy a little bit tougher, but usually you can set that one up by just, you know, dropping in Vanquishers on the side uh, and running Aether Wings onto one side and the next turn scoring it. So just with a little bit of foresight, you can end up scoring it. Now, we, we originally thought we were going to include uh, Knight's Excelsior version, but after a lot of playtesting, we just don't think it's got the gas. Um, and one of the issues there 
is that, yeah, making making Grand Hammer's battle line is cool, but it doesn't really score you lead into the Maelstrom because Grand Hammer's have this problem of they either wipe out everything they're fighting or they just... Or they die. Or they die. <laughs> and you're not scoring lead into the Maelstrom in either way. Um, so it just doesn't seem like it's worth it. Like the plus one, plus one is okay, right? It doesn't increase their max damage. It's really just a plus one hit buff on Grand Hammer's. And it mm-hmm. doesn't do anything for questers, which are uh, an equally valid drop option. Uh, there's even times where I've considered, you know, two questers and one grand hammer, just because there's so many armies that have so many models these days. Um, I wish there was a way to make questers battle line. I mean, they have the paladin conclave like symbols all over them, but man, like this keyword yeah. uh, thing with the uh, stormcast is annoying me. If there yeah, was a way was... to make them battle line, that would be great, man. That would yeah, be great. we're seeing a lot of warbands that are battle line. Claws of Karanak, Royal Beast Lair. It's just, you know, we get the Stormcast uh, shit under the stick, I guess. I don't know. Yep. All the Chaos Cults, Splitter Thing, battle line. Yeah, I don't I don't recall many battle line that aren't, sorry, many um, war kind of warbands that aren't battle line. Maybe it's the Seraphon one, isn't Yeah. But, you know, they've, they've got their own host of, like, so many battle line. I don't think they care. Yeah. I think it's like yeah. a, it's a stupid lore reason. And, and not that lore reasons are stupid, because this is a narrative game after all, but it's like the questers are supposed to be rare, and that in their minds means they shouldn't be battle line. Like they're a group of heroes. Each one of them is a hero model. So it's like having Varangar, but I guess Varangar are battle line, so that doesn't matter. That argument's thrown right. out the window. <laughs> well, and what's what's bizarre about it is that the members of these soul sworn groups are primarily drawn from the paladin like conclave like they're paladins why they don't have the paladin keyword is baffling well there there is a lot of reforging between chambers right like sometimes you'll you'll die as a paladin you get reforged into a redeemer and then the next day you'll be reforged into a justicar right like it all depends on what's needed in the battle at the time um so i guess it makes sense if you're being reforged into a quester you don't necessarily carry any of the baggage of your previous conclaves with you. It's like a different, I don't know. It's, it's a mess. I agree with you guys. I'm, I'm really trying hard here to, to justify it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, I feel like they could be, or at least like, you know, they could have like the way they've been doing it for some other tones where like this unit becomes battle line for each of this unit. They too. Um, if they were paladin, that would be really cool. Like not even just for battle line, but like, yeah, let's say, you that, know, make them play with our holy commands a little. Yeah. More synergy. How about how about that as a concept in the Stormcast book? <laughs> what a novel concept in a book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the I think the drop style overall though is is good. I think that I think it's got gas for four ones and five O's if you're real lucky. Um, but good players should be able to take this to to a four one. Maybe not this exact list, but I think this is the direction it's got to go in with the Tempesters and Dracolines. All right, let's talk Big Dragon. And we're going to talk a lot of Big Dragon for a little while here. So if, if you like talking about Karazai and Krondus, this is the this is the part of the video you came for. Uh, first up, we've got St. Karazai. Now, I pioneered the St. Karazai list originally back on Warhammer Weekly right after we started the podcast, Mergonk. Um, and, it's, and it's come a long way. And by that, I mean Karazai's points have dropped a long way. <laughs> And I mean, we just, not that much. What has he lost? Like 80 points? He's 70 that points day. down. Everything oh, around yeah. him keeps getting cheaper too, though, which is nice. Um, well, now, yeah. David, David, this is yeah. your version of the list. Run us through it, man. All right. So I know the big biggest complaint is you'll see this theme a lot whenever you're playing Karazai is you always feel you want just a little bit more points. I'm not like greedy where I'm like, give me two, 300 more points, points in my list. I'm not saying that. I just want like 50 through 50 to like 150 extra. Just like so I take like an extra support hero or an extra um, screen or just something a little bit more. Like profounds or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not like I'm not asking for like a crazy amount of points. I'm just asking for like one more thing. Um, so go, going back. So the core concept is obviously just guard is castellant. Um, and then your Arcanum casting spells buff Karazai, you send Karazai somewhere between a three or four objective, wherever, wherever battle plan you're playing, you kind of want him to bully um, in a radius so you could consist- consistently hold more points than your opponent. Um, now, the thing with Gardas is that's always reiterated is the Gardas tax. And the problem with Hollow Knights is you always have to take three Redeemer units. Unless you make Karazai a general and you take dragons, but that's a whole other 
concept, but for when you're running Gardas, you have to take three Redeemers. So Gardas, that's why Gardas feels like he's 260. And the only way to get around that tax that I found is you pretty much strip everything you can and take judic and take Judicators. Um, in the game I played, um, the two the two games I played, um, the Judicators were nice. I won't lie, the Judicators were pretty nice. They helped clean up screens. Um, they made they also helped the Tempesters. Like if I was gonna, for example, when I played Soul Blight, um, I was worried that my Tempesters wouldn't be able to wipe a twenty man unit of um, Dead Walkers because for some reason Soul Blight players love rolling six ups like they're five ups. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a recurring theme. Um, so the Jew here has actually kind of helped out with that. Um, they made it a little bit easier for the Tempe Tempesters to um, get that ten kill those kill those uh, ten plus wounds. Um, Judy cares also, you don't really have to babysit them. You shouldn't be babysitting them. Like all our attacks should be saved for the Tempesters um, in the shooting phase. So a hundred, so a hundred ninety point unit just to go bully um, other screens or just honestly, like also like little small characters um, if they're out of position. Judy cares are really good at punishing bad positioning. Um, but overall, I mean the big, the big man is Karazai. So. Guardians versus Predators is always, always, always a talk. Um, I haven't found a defining reason why I want one or the other. Because I'm always in a situation where running three Predators or running Guardians, like could matter in different situations. So, with Predators, it gives you access to Hammers. And having access to Hammers of Sigmar is massive in this season. Because Tempesters become battle line. And the Pesters being battle line is amazing. Um, Guardians yeah, is a lot of points, but yeah. I think the main reason is like, or not reason, but I think it, it comes down to a difference in play style. If you want to be aggressive with Karazai, you have to take Guardians because his thing extends in a twelve inch aura. He can run right. six inches, so that's like twenty three inches effective aura worth of aura you can get. With Praetors, you have to run an anvil style. You can't charge Karazai out. You have to run him up and sort of invite the opponents to attack him, and then counter hit them back. Um, so yeah, it depends on what you're comfortable with doing, essentially. Exactly. So like, exactly what you were saying. So like, in my games with Gardas, I was able to just kind of slingshot Karazai, because I just dropped Karazai where I need him, and he's good to go. Um, with Praetors, like, like you said, like you do have to hold him back a little bit, and kind of build a little more castle, which in some battle plans it's fine because there are battle plans that are like three to four objective, or like even the five or six ones are still like in this small little bubble um, that you should be able to move to reasonably. Um, but there are battle plans where you're like, man, I really want to run all the way over there and charge really far, but my prey tours are going to go away and there's nothing to do about it. Um, now, the other thing about this list that um, is interesting. Um, is the Knight Arcanum, and this is where I'm saying that, like, I wish GW would just give me, like, a little more points. Um, 20. Just 20 points. <laughs> just 20. Like, like, 20 points. Yep. Just, like, literally, just make Karazai 500, and we're fine. I don't care. I'll, I'll stop complaining about everything. <laughs> so I can make that Arcanum an Encantor, because I really, really want the Encantor, but you can't take an Encantor with a list like this, um, unless you drop the Judicators down to 100 points and use a 20 and then 50 for other things. Um, but I will say that Nair Kingdom hasn't been awful. I mean, he's he's he fills the same role as like the Relicator. I mean, he's a wizard on a stick, and in this season at least, wizard on a stick is not bad because when you take bottom turn and that Nair Kingdom is now a two cast wizard, a two cast wizard for a hundred points feels amazing. It feels really really good. Yeah. Um, well, after you use the dispel scroll and the encounter, that's that's what he becomes, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Um, still not so, and also since the biggest thing too, Bale Mage. Bale Mage is gone. That's really sad. Um, so Nyarkam is pretty much our cheapest wizard now, and um, the I, the three inch um no endless spell thing isn't also the worst thing in the world. Um, depending how you position, what position you could get, you could kind of keep them keep them up with Gardas and make sure Gardas doesn't die doesn't die to a 15 roll jaws next to him because jaws has to be has he can't fly over you and it has to land within an inch 
and you can't put anything within three inches of Nine Arcana. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, it doesn't stop a, ma- a maelstrom. <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen a lot, but it is it is tech that you can do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, have been really enjoying it. Karazai is great. Um, hope other people keep using Karazai because our big dragons do deserve love. He feels great, you know. Um, unless I see the, I think it's got some issues with consistency because there's so many things that shut off wards and commands these days, and that kind of just kills Karazai when that happens. But against most armies, like if you're talking casual plus, like you're playing RTTs and not GTs, Karazai's super fun, right? Yeah, like if you're is. not playing against the hardest of hard lists, he is a super fun addition, and he's like three, two, four, one material out of GT. I think like you'll face one bad matchup and then you'll submarine up to the up to the top. Um, he's just so fun, right? He he, I, uh, every other hammer we have, like uh, every time you play Fulminators or Draculins or whatever, you take 10 wounds. Okay, you've lost a lot of damage output. Karazai, first of all, he doesn't take ten, the 10 wounds. <laughs> he takes a lot less than that because of his abilities and his defensive profile and even just minus one attack all the time is, is amazing. So he takes less damage to begin with and he just stays there in that spot until he takes all 18 of his wounds usually through a five up ward and plus three to saves sometimes plus four with, with, with finest hour. Um, so bully is really the right word. Like that really yeah. encapsulates what he does. He just, Oh, you want to get on this objective? No, you just smack him away with your tail. <laughs> yeah. It feels really good to do that. Um, and when you can like successfully pin something with this 14 inch flying move, you can charge stone horns before they can charge you. And that feels really, really good. Um, just so much utility wrapped up in this guy. And despite the fact that that this list just doesn't have anything disposable, like it doesn't have Aether Wings, it doesn't have any teleports, uh, we still give it a three in Battle Tactics because Karazai and Tempesters can, you know, unless you get a really bad matchup, but they'll definitely score Dra- Draconet's Destruction. And anytime you face a list with a monster, Karazai is also just going to eat that monster and score you uh, a Matter of Honor. So even though you don't have the disposable units you might want for a Surround and Destroy, you're still going to score other tactics along the way, usually. Yeah. Yes. I think that something like this is going to be very, very cool when we get our next round of point drops in a month. Um, I know you guys are really bagging on the Battle Mage. I still think the Battle Mage is a good pick here. If Even he had minus one hit, I wish the, just the minus one hit spell stuck around. That would have been great. Um, I don't know. It's too hard to find 100 points in this list. And not just that, it's too hard to find 100 points and a leader slot, right? Because personally, I would I would go, I would, I don't know, I think I might go more drops here. Like, I, I don't, that's just me. I do have a list with the Battle Mage, though. I, th- I think you're right, there is play in him, but he's not, not nearly I as spe- good. I, I don't know, man. I think, I think... I think we're going to find that the bat. I will prove you wrong. I will okay. prove to you that the bat that the new battle mage is just as good as the old battle mage. I really genuinely think because think about it, right? Like, not only are you getting a plus one cast or plus one dispel wizard for a hundred points, he also is a two cast wizard because he can take a mortal wound in the hero phase to cast two spells. Well, he doesn't do all of those things. He gets one. He gets one effect. I thought those were separate abilities. No, no, no. Mm. You get one. <laughs> you don't get six abilities on him. He gets one. Oh, I, okay. I thought I misread it. I thought the <laughs> second column. I, okay. I thought the second column was separate from the first column. We've been arguing about this for like months. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about another big dragon list. Uh, so this is a pretty, sig- it's a significant enough variation on, on the Karazai list, uh, this one drops Gardas to pick up Praetors and allowing you to go Hammers of Sigmar instead, uh, which allows you to have Battle Line Tempesters, which really helps Battle Tactics. So you can see the, the Battle Tactics score shoots up from three, which is like the average, up to four, which is like above average. Um, so this looks better. And then especially the Lord Arcanum on Griff Charger here. Cycle the Storm is relevant sometimes. You know, um, he's got Thundershock. He can teleport in range. And then next turn, cast Thundershock to give everything minus one wound. He's got the Scintillating Trail, which is a nice little minus one unbind thing uh, for all your other wizards. Um, 
yeah, it's it's a good addition, you know, dropping uh, Gardas for him and then picking up a unit of Praetors. It's it's a good swap, uh, but I mean, we guys already pretty much talked about it, right? Like it's got problems with 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 speed and mobility. Um, do you think it might be worthwhile to bring in a priest just to translocate the yeah the Praetors around? Say. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, so that I would did. Be, that would be my pick. Yeah, so I did try this list um, with. Uh... With the Lord Relictor and um, with the Warlord Battalion instead, so I have Translocation and Divine Light. Um, that felt pretty good. The only thing I didn't like about the list is I didn't like not having a fifth hero for so I could run. I mean, a Commander Entourage and or Warlord and the uh, Acolytes Battalion. The Acolytes Battalion just feels really, really, really good with Karazai because like you want Celestial Blades to go off, you want Mystic Shield to go off. And, or even just casting like a blizzard, like for bad matchups, like just being able to throw four dice at Merciless Blizzard and just your 120 point model just picking up something, triple his cost, feels really good. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so that is the other variation I have, I have done is Command Entourage, um, or you can do Warlord. And then taking Translocation and Divine Light. Because there are turns having divine light, you want divine light. There are turns you want, you just want the teleport. Mm-hmm. Um, and then shaman or eater to magic is even possible too. I just really like the grand strategy of spell casting savant because in all the games I've played, Karazai and the other hammers like the evocators and the tempesters are such an enough threat that your opponent is not going to waste enough resources unless they're in a position where they have to kill them to like win them the game but usually they're not they're it's not they're not really going after your your heroes in the first three turns if they're going after your heroes probably everything else is dead but you can't ignore karazai you can't ignore tempesters and you can't ignore evocators if karazai is allowed to rip and tear through your army he's going to rip and tear through your army yeah that's what i like about karazai this season um he's not like previous seasons, we built the whole list around him and then maybe we had enough room for a side hammer, right? This season, you can run three hammers. Karazai is just one of your three threats, right? Your opponent still has to answer your pra- your uh, Tempesters and they still have to answer your Dracolines and they still have to answer anything that has Merciless Blizzard too, right? Like right. That, should, that shouldn't be ignored. Um, so these are like a multi-threat approach means that even if one of your things gets countered and it will right like you have to play the game assuming your opponent will destroy one of your key pieces you'll it's the amount of key pieces you have left after that um now of course that there's always like a dance you have to do there where every time you bring an important hammer unit well you'll have less screens and support and and battle tactics units so it's a it's a that's delicate only, balance yeah so that's the only downside about hammers right like you i only have really two true screens which are vanquishers and one will come back with call for aid um, but honestly, Karazai can be, a, depending on obviously your opponent, Karazai can be enough an animal himself. Um, I know Paul was talking about it. Um, there's a good, if you have, if you get the Mystic Shield off with Lantern, Mystic Shield and just Finest Hour, like your opponent probably doesn't have the resources to lift him. Like he could just tank at plus three with a Praetor Ward and he could be like, come come and remove me this turn because you're not going to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he can just be so tanky. Like if your opponent doesn't have rent three, rent four sometimes, they're not moving him. And uh, and that feels really good. Just got to watch out for those mortal wounds. <laughs> oh, yeah, mortal wounds are bad. <laughs> they, they, they feel really bad. So, um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm really, I'm not super... I wish Praetors were also like 120. Praetors need to be like 110, 120. I there's no reason. That. Yeah. Praetors no reason need to be 140. And the game, the way the game is now, there's zero reason the Praetors need to be 140 points. No, but more importantly, Praetors their ability needs to be updated. Oh um, yeah, just make need, them battle land. Make they, their, they, yeah. No, they they need to have the the bodyguard rule the way that it's presented in Cities of Sigmar when. When you put the Praetors in your list, you pick the hero they're bodyguarding, and that way you could drop the Praetors onto the table using Scions where you need Karasai to be. I think 120 and battle line if you have a Lord or Draconith hero as Ooh. your in your list, or general, let's say even. 
I think that would work. I agree. Because like I, rule changes are tougher, right? Point yeah, changes are simpler. Sure. Pitch battle profiles are always simpler. Um, yeah, for sure. And one forty for that unit just doesn't feel right. Although, let's say they're one twenty. Would you ever bring reinforced praetors? Because they basically yeah. just be questers. Yeah, I would just take. I would. I just want them to be battle line. Yeah. If you have a lord, you make one battle line. Just one unit, no more than one. Sure, I'm exactly. down with that. I agree. All right, and the last Karazai list we want to talk about today, uh, which I just called Alpha Predators because I looked at the list that you that you gave us here, David, and I was like, yeah, this feels like the Apex Predators of Gur just going around eating everything. Um, yeah. The main gimmick here is that uh, if you make Karazai the general, Storm Drake Guard become battle line. And that fixes one of the core problems with with the Storm Drakes is that they're just so expensive. Paying 340 and and having to pay for a battle line slot on top of that is a lot. But when they become battle line... That makes them a more reasonable proposition. Um, so that's pretty much what this list is doing, right? It's like, how do we fit four Storm Drakes and Karazai in a single list? Still have some units that can score battle tactics, right? We take uh, the five Vanquishers uh, to to call for aid, but then we take five Vanguard Hunters just to teleport them around and score tactics that way. Boy, you don't get a lot of points left over afterwards, though, huh? <laughs> yeah, no. So this is like this is like magnifying the problems that I run into Kara's eye lists that I always want like a hundred more points. Like like <laughs> that's like that's a GW. Um so I know people have been asking a lot for how do you fit Kara's eye and with four storm drake guard. Um in general it's hard to run both because they're both such a point investment <laughs> that they themselves are expensive, but then you also need to bring in this additional two to three hundred points so that those expensive units are also not dying. Right, because like we're not like Harizai isn't a gate breaker. Like he doesn't come with thirty five wounds. He comes with eight wounds and a three plus save. Like if you don't protect him, he's gonna get lifted. Um, Storm Drake Guard, pretty much same thing. Thirty six wounds, three plus save. I mean, it's, they're a little, they're double the amount of resilience, but they can still easily get, easily get lifted without something to help them. Yeah. Um, so I there is a player. Um, in our state, who's gone four or one with the Karazai and Drake Guard list twice? Um, I played it at one of our GTs down here um, in February. It also went um, three two. It should have been four one, but dice game. Uh, <laughs> and that's honestly just the kind of the downside of always when I was playing it a lot was just I always wanted one more unit, and you don't have access to that. Um, Nice thing about the list is that it's not really that hard to play. You have Karazai, you have four strength, four storm drake guards. Um, you kind of just move them up, and you kind of dominate like a zone with them. So, what I would do in a three or four objective uh, or five objective mission, either way, would just I position them where I knew both of those units wouldn't have to go too far to go to an objective. Um, while at the same time still being relatively close to my support heroes. Because that's the other thing, is now you have two units that want all the buffs, but you have to now allocate those buffs um, if more efficiently than if every one of these units were just going to get everything. Mm -hmm. um, Tactic-wise, um, this season at least, um, it's not that bad. Uh, four Strong Guard should be able to lift things um, relatively easily. Same um, with Karazai. Um, they do complement each other a little bit. Um, I say this only because one thing I noticed against a Soul Blight, for example, which is a popular army, and you will be playing it at GTs. Um, so Force Stream Regard with like Swords, for example, will have a much easier time dealing with a Vampire Lord and a Zombie Dragon than a Karazai. Because unless that guy puts his Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon next to like 20 zombies, Karazai has trouble getting through sometimes through that ethereal push unless he had previous support. Where four storm, four storm Drake guards should reliably, between their breath and their sword attacks, should be able to just lift up that lord way easier. And Karazai could go kill um, chaff or just other medium sized units that are easier to pick up for him. So they do kind of complement their weaknesses because Storm Drake guard are more weak to horde. Um, while Karazai is a little more weak to like super anvil um, well, just 
just save stack, yeah. right? Ethereal. Yeah. Things that can get passed as Rend 3, which is, there's not much, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, there isn't much. Um, but, yeah. Well, so, Karazai feels pretty good in general as a defensive piece into that army because it's mostly like two attack infantry. Uh, and then when you face the Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon, yeah, he can go up to Ren 3, right? But Karazai can go up to plus four save. And there's no way to roar him in, in Astral Templar. So, yeah, you're yeah. you're on twos with everything just bounces off you. Yeah, that's also why I picked Astral Templars because I feel like um, you need the... You can't get roared. Like, these units just can't get roared, especially when you can't give one of one or the other all the buffs is being able to all out defense one of them is really really strong remember uh, the days when roar was the only way to shut off commands <laughs> what a glorious time we took advantage of yes um, we didn't know how good we had it mm-hmm. like also with this list um i really also do wish um i had another 20 points to give an encantor a deus um one thing i do notice uh, when I run Karazai lists, is positioning the small foot heroes to try to keep up with Karazai can be extremely difficult. So these previous lists that have a da- Deus is really nice because now my wizard moves 12 inches and yeah. I'm only really relying on a dice roll for like a Gardas or for a, a Castellant, which like you want to eliminate the chance you want to eliminate your bad chances as much as possible, and I think a Deus, especially at 20 points, is really, really good for that. I think we'll see a lot more of this with Deus is just for the movement tricks you could do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I really dig the Deus. 20 points is the right cost for it. That's what I've always said. Yeah, so this list definitely shows some of the shortcomings of bringing Storm Drake Guard outside of the like Castellant Gardas dedicated combo with them. Um, I mean, one of them is that the grand strategy here is control the Nexus, which is... Yeah. Ugh, so it's that's, a, that's bad. Yeah. So that's the other thing I, I I did not like about this list, is I was really struggling finding a grand strategy that I really, really liked. So the issue is, at least in my... that you, you, I think one thing I should reiterate, too, is whatever meta you guys are playing at, um, I kind of always... I learned this from 40k. Um, that I always kind of tailor my list to what I expect to see at a GT or not. And mm-hmm. GT is very GT is very depending where you're going. Um, I, don't, I have a lot of Soul Blight players down by me, so taking a Grand Charger like Overshadow kind of feels bad when a lot of your Soul Blight players are jumping on the 160 zombie train. Yep. <laughs> so I even though they could even though you don't have to kill the the destroyed units, you only have to kill um, the ones that. The, the first the first volley of them it's still it's like something you don't want to do like right like i don't want karazai only killing zombie units all game like i need him to do more than that yeah. especially uh, when he you know goes into a unit of 60 zombies lifts them and then takes 20 mortal wounds back well if you hit them on the right angle that won't happen yeah i do i do like it they, i think it should have been one inch i don't know agreed but <laughs> that's, fine. that's fine that's fine that's, that's fine, fine. But you're absolutely right. Uh, so, um, Control of Nexus here, um, I only chose because in most battle plans, you Karazai kind of hangs out in the middle because he needs, again, always to be within a two to four objective bully range. Um, so he could kind of help you bully the middle, and then you just throw... You have the Griff Charger, and you have the Encanter Castellan, which also should be around Karazai anyway. So the Grip Charger teleports, and those two, uh, you can't turn Castle in. You could also always just auto run to get holy within six of the, uh, of the center. Um, I wish I, re- I really I really wish again for this list I had hundred points so Karazai did not have to be the general, um, and then I could just go back to spell casting seven or something else. Are you um, also missing out on Shaman here, right? Yeah, you also missing out on Shaman, which just feels awful. Yeah. Um, I've been really a big fan of of Shaman, I will say. Um Horfrost is great. Um Merciless Blizzard is amazing. Um or, like I feel like Horfrost is just such a good spell with Stormcast only because <laughs> pretty much every dice any dice any D3 you roll on that spell is is useful, right? Like if my evocators just happen to be near um my encanter or my spellcaster casting Horfrost, any amount of rend on a staff is going to be good, right? Um, yes. 
Oh, we're going to talk about foot evocators oh. very soon. <laughs> and then, even on like Karazai's tail, which it's very situational, but I did do it against a unit of 10 Blood Knights that wanted to act like an anvil, and, I, and then I just happened to go for that risk of um, getting a Ren 3 tail attack. Ren 3 tails attack but Karazai is really funny. Yeah, what do you need it against, though? Everything that's, like, good with the tail is usually a 5-up save. Yeah. So, yeah, Horfrost is, Horfrost is good. Um, I think it helps Stormcast a lot. Like, even, um, like, we were big oh, on Cluster Soul You need Storm. the Ren 3 tail so you can put the attacks into someone else. Oh, not yes. Yeah, yeah, fair, yeah. fair. It's like, <laughs> if I'm trying to kill RK on next to 30 Splintered Fang, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. I hope they, I hope they leave the tail alone. Let me, let me drop like a bucket of dice against something else. Oh god, why would you kill Archaon instead of the 30 Splintered Fang? Those gotta die. <laughs> They're so much more important. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Karazai could be 500. Karazai needs to be 500. Oh, for sure. He's super fun, yeah. though. Yeah, he is fun. And I, I am I am gonna try my hardest to 4-1 with him. <laughs> Do it, man. It's a good goal for the season. <laughs> Alright, let's talk about the other big dragon, Krondis, uh, who, ha- who has gotten exactly zero mentions until this point. Uh, Krondis has not gotten a lot of discussion, and that's probably for a good reason. Um, he's just not as easy to use as Karazai, right? Krondis is more of a buffing support wizard that happens to have a big monster body attached to him, and for his cost, that's never really felt great. Uh, usually you end up short on bodies or support or damage um, because there's very specific units you want to combo with him. Now, luckily, the units you want to combo with him are Tempestors and Dracolines and Judicators. And these things that usually have, you know, Rend 0, Rend 1, that get a huge boost from getting up to, to Rend 1 or Rend 2. So I thought, yeah, let's give Krondus a try this season. Um, so how do we build that list? Well, we need Krondus, obviously. The spell we want to give him is Thundershock. We want to teleport him in range so he can cast his spell and Thundershock or, you know, Geminids. Because um, if he casts his spell in Geminids, that's effectively shredding two armor off people because they can't all out defense and they'll have minus one save. That means your Tempesters that drop in after that, now they're at rend three instead of rend one, effectively. Uh, some things with a four up save, they just they just don't. They, they don't. They'll have a six up save instead. Um, and that feels really, really, really good if you're, if you're looking for volume fire. Um, then Krondus becomes like a huge body. So before you translocate him, you want to be casting Mystic Shield on him with the Knight Zephyros. You want to be casting maybe Celestial Blades on him with the Knight Encantor. Um, then you want screening units, you know, cheap chaff that can get in front of him to, to protect him from the really scary stuff because you're not running Praetors, you're not running a Gardas in this list. You're, you know, you're just accepting the fact that you have basically a Mock Crusher here with no bodyguards. And yeah, the Mock Crusher might die. But uh, thankfully... Tempestors, Long Strikes, and Dracolines are such good threats that even if your opponent overextends and kills Krondus, you still have a pretty good chance of winning here. Um, so if you want to play Ren 3 Krondus, or Ren 3 Tempestors, with Krondus casting Thundershock to debuff everything and Geminids shutting off commands very reliably, huge body that gets in the way, the tail attack does really well, I think there's gas in the tank for him. Um, if you want more bodies, one of the options you could do here is to swap three Long Strikes for six Questers and then swap Thunderbolt Volley for Call for Aid. But I think you just want more shooting with this, because you want to be able to capitalize on that big Krondus turn when you teleport him forward, cast a spell. This key unit is now debuffed. You can just blow it up with Thunderbolt Volley, Long Strikes, and, and all that. So, um, yeah, that's about as far as I got with Krondus this season. Obviously looking better than previous seasons, right? You've got the Primal Dice for both casting and unbinding, which feels a lot better. We've just got point drops across the board since the last time I tried playing this. Um... But you can see it's still at a 99 wound count, which feels really, really bad. Um, yeah, that's about all I've got to say about Krondus. What do you guys think? Yeah, um, I think one thing I also skipped over. So Primal Dice with this season does make wizards like Krondus, even Tyclus, a little bit weaker. Because somebody could just throw, you have plus three, and somebody just throws three, four dice. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that plus three didn't match. Um, well, I thought about that, but I look at it as primal dice efficiency. If you have plus three, that means your normal casting doesn't need the primals, and you're forcing your opponent to use their primals. That's true. So I think that what is- you could do here is probably swap the Knight Encanter Celestial Blades for Merciless Blizzard. Um, that's probably even what you should do, frankly. Um, and then you just have a second target that you can bait out all the good unbinding with Krondis, because everybody's like, oh, big dragon wizard, got to get rid of his unbinding, right? And then you translocate a wizard in range and blizzard. Yes. 
that that's also that's also an option. Yeah, I think I think the I think one of the keys this season has been primal dice management. Like, if you're wasting so many of your primal dice because you need so many x x amount of spells to go off, it feels really bad when you flip to your opponent's turn and you don't have any primal dice to throw against theirs against their key spells. Um, so there is a balancing act. I think Ronti also needs to be like 480. I think that'd be more fair for him. Oh, I don't disagree um, at all. <laughs> I would yeah. love it if he was cheaper. Yeah, um, but I think he has. I think he has some play. Um, I wish we had old Hollow Heart back. Um, I ran him in a Hollow Heart, old Hollow Heart, and oh man, it was Crondy just. Oh, is he just a monster? When he's a three spell <laughs> wizard casting good spells, <laughs> and he gets a uh, seer wounds to heal himself. Oh man, it was yeah. yeah. But that's that's the, that's gone now, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah, Krondus feels good. He he combos with the units we want to use anyway. Um, it's it's worth exploring. I think. I, don't, I think it's it's pretty good. All right, now we get into the weird stuff. These are we call these the uniques uh, because they use unique units like Indrasta, Gardas, Bastion, um, stuff that is very specific and very weird. Right, this is what we call the uniques. Um, so I'm going to start off with a list called Meat, Meat, Meat. And it has almost no shooting, which is very rare for me. It has Andrasta, Gardas, and 18 Quester Soulsworn, uh, backed up by a Knight and Cantor with Shaman and Celestial Blaze, just to buff as many Soulsworn as you can. Uh, and then three units of Vindictors. So the whole idea here is you have a lot of three-up save models that you're trying to revive, and they all get a five-up board. Uh, Stormstrike Chariot fits in here as like a faster piece that also has a three-up save and 12 wounds, so it's just a big... Just tons of meat. I don't know how good this is going to be, uh, but I figure if everybody else is doing recursion, maybe Stormcast can do it too, right? Like, this might be a thing, because you can contest objectives. Like, on certain battle plans, if you're playing Geomantic Pulse, this is... Every single one of these quest stores counts as three models. That's a ton of model count. There's going to be some armies that just can't shove you off. So I think it could actually see some competitive viability. It feels weird not to, not to have more shooting, though, I'll tell you. <laughs> I do like that Yandrasha does work on the Soul Sworn. Like, thank you, GW, for making that. Just leaving that alone. Just make, just make her a little bit more playable. Um, point costs are for her need to go down a lot. But she's, she's getting better. She's almost there, I feel like. I... Almost yeah, there. I, I want to see her at 220, personally. I think that would be the right point value for her. Because she's only as good as how much stuff you bring in the list for her to revive. And questers seem like the best thing in the game to revive for her, right? They're high impact, they count as a lot of models. Um, they, there's also a cool timing interaction here, because in Drasta's ability, it doesn't say at the start of the hero phase, what you can do is you can teleport Quester Soulsworn out of combat near Indrasta, revive models, and then charge back in. And because you revive the models within an inch of a model that was revived, you can shorten your charge distance usually by like inch and a half, two inches. So you effectively jump out of combat, revive, and then get a seven inch charge. Yes. Which is neat. I don't know how useful it'll be. <laughs> but uh, if you want to try this like slow, grindy play style, like if you want to try playing Coalesced, but with Stormcast, <laughs> this might be the way to do it. If you happen to be the one person who's bought three boxes of Questers so far, and you have all this stuff, yeah, put it together. Let me know how it goes. Honestly, you should, everyone should just buy one just because you could use all the models as like proxy for other things. Like the Praetor looking one with the Lantern like could easily either be like a Praetor hero, Praetor Prime or like a Countess Lord Castlet. Like y'all should just buy the box because it's it has oh, yeah. just amazing models that could count as other things. Yep. I don't recommend anyone buy this many questers just for this list. But if you happen to have them, then try it. All right. Continuing our streak of weird, unique lists, let's talk about a Stormcast Cronspine list. Uh, so, Corbs, this is one of yours, and um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of weird stuff in here, right? <laughs> so let's go over <laughs> just how weird this list is. Uh, first off, there's a Lord Arcanum on foot, not like an Arcanum on Griff Charger or whatever, like just a regular Lord Arcanum yeah. so that you can pump the Maelstrom even further, uh, because the yep. idea here is you're trying to rupture the Cronspine 
and then have the cron spine eat the maelstrom. And yes. uh, then the cron spine's wild, it goes up to level three, and the game is worse for everybody involved. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, other weird stuff, Knight Relictor's here, Translocation, and no High Priest. So you're just looking for those three ups to uh, to teleport, hopefully, right? <laughs> um, uh-huh. And that's not that weird. Like, the more I get into list building and playing Stormcast this season, the more I'm starting to think maybe we don't need High Priest. You know, like, Morgonk, how many games of second edition did we play with a three up Translocation? Like, we can do that again, right? Like, it's it's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 doable unless you're one of those people really gunning for, like, a turn one Thunderbolt Volley, which I honestly, like, I, I've played recently, and I don't think that's important. I think we could go without it. I think Shaman with, like, yeah, Lord of Conum, but mostly on Griff Charger, because I think that the Scintillating Trail is, like, a pretty good debuff to have. I, I, think I, really uh-huh. good. I think what tips it for me isn't just that Shaman is a good command trait. It's the combination of Shaman and Spellcasting Savant being really the only good grand strategy. Grand strategy, yep. Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. I think you're for right. us, at least. Yeah. yeah. Now, now with this list, I could actually see this list going overshadow because you've got that block of six Tempesters who are sturdy, <clears> right? <throat> like, they are not going anywhere. Um, yeah. But I think what you're trying to do here... Are you just dropping them into play, or are you translocating them up? Like, what is the translocate doing for you here? Yeah, so essentially, like, you know, we always hear a lot of, like, high-skilled players talking about trades and stuff and, and threats, and really, I was trying to build something that had at least five threats, which is difficult. Like, you can build something with three to four threats, but I, I find it difficult to build something, uh, you know, with five. Um... And so, you know, there's various things you could do here. Like, so the, the Tempesters on their own are a threat, right? Um, so that just drop in, literally destroy whatever you want. It's That's the worst Unleash Hell to come into. It's really difficult to take that many things out. Like that in itself is is uh, pretty crazy. So the... Um, the you you asked specifically about the translocation and so the knight relictor and the knight encanter kind of like hang out a little bit and as soon as the encanter uh has used its scroll um you try to get a turn where you teleport it up and it casts blizzard so it's taking blizzard that's a threat in and of itself at that point you're like you know what i don't need this encanter anymore i'm gonna pop up and try and nuke one of these heroes. And and that's a trade, you know? And that's a trade, depending on where you're at, you've got Acolytes, so you're getting extra Primal Dice. Let's say you have three Primal Dice. I think it's a pretty good trade to try to make. Unless, you're, um, you unless your miss- casting roll is a six and a one, <laughs> like I do every well, single sure. time. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Paul, maybe maybe you shouldn't try this one. <laughs> I, no, I would still do it. What are you talking about? I do it all the time, but yeah. I'm just saying, I always go roll ones. It. Anytime I try to no, cast no, would, Blizzard, there's a yeah, one. Yeah, I would still pump two primals into it. Let's go. If, if I've Either teleported I, the Encanter up, I would. But normally, yeah. it's like, I get charged, and then I'm trying to cast a defensive <laughs> Blizzard, and it's like, not only will the Encanter die, but everything around will also take D3 mortals. Like, that's not worth yeah. it. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, then you obviously have the Maelstrom. That's a ongoing threat. Um, you get it extra far, so you can really get it into where it's going to be probably closer to one of their wizards in the back line. Uh, and having the wizards take, you know, three automatically is, it can add up. It's pretty intense. Um, and also you, you want to push it away from you. There's a lot of benefit in having that thing get further from you because, you know, I've been hearing more and more people talk about how, like, you know, they're not paying attention to it. And then all of a sudden when it goes off, it's hitting them, too. Um, so that that range growing can be pretty intense, right? Um, so that's one of them. And then one of my favorite threats, which I used to play about a year ago um, when I first started going to, bigger, going to bigger tournaments and stuff, but is the Storm Strike, uh, Storm Strike Chariot played horizontally, so super wide sideways, and kind of uh, trailed by two fulminators, and only two fulminators, but far enough back so that you can't get pulled into combat. And essentially, you move forward uh, as with this giant, annoying chariot screen that's you know difficult for it to die, and you can charge it in if you want to, but either way, 
you basically uh, tar pit a unit or two units or whatever you want. And by the time your turn comes back, your fulminators should still be good. And those two fulminators with their 10 inch move, and then, you know, you're going to get a three charge on whatever's stuck to the chariot, uh, will literally just mop up everything else that's stuck on that chariot chariot. So this is something that I used to do before. And those two units together, um, the, the, the single two fulminators with that chariot make, make a pretty mean threat if, if played properly so that the fulminators don't get brought into combat. Yeah, I actually agree with that. I used to use pretty much a very similar combo, but obviously with annihilators. Like I used to use chariots to nice. hold them in place, and then yeah. annihilators to pop in and just sort of squeeze in with their tiny footprint and just kill something. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a reason you went fulminators over something? Like oh no, you're. I see. You need battle line. I was gonna say that's why. To I know. Yeah. I, I so I when I was building this, I was playing around with the cats a bit and trying to get that to work. It's too bad they're not you know, battle line and anything, but yeah, this is why in order to get the six tempesters to actually work with points, uh, this, this is where it landed. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not and they're just as effective. Yeah. yeah they're, they're, totally. they're, they're not bad units. Yeah. We're just, we're a bit of hot on even caters right now as you can, you probably <laughs> totally. for those. Yeah. Units. And then obviously the, the final threat or trade is the cron swine. And we all know how annoying that thing is. Um, yeah, and just being able to rupture it and then, like, send it up and maybe eat your maelstrom, like, that is just vicious. So when you look at some of the armies that are doing that with Cronspine, um, they also don't have something like six tempesters and, like, fulminators and all these other things, right? So I think, I think there's a lot of threat here. I think, obviously, you know, you have to play pretty aggressive. Um, so that's why I put, like, uh, steadfast march potentially instead of call for aid um mm. and so you don't really need screens either like you really want things to just go up and uh mess with mess with the enemy so i have not brought this to a tournament um i think i would i think i might, I might, I think, I might build this yeah i, so I was I don't very have... close to bringing this to nova i was i was thinking about it and i have all this stuff and i was like oh man should i but it's a bit too soon, and uh, you know, I only kept up with the list a couple of weeks ago and tried it once. But yeah. yeah, what do you guys think, Paul? I have I have three random thoughts here. <laughs> uh, okay. First off, this has come to mind. I should have talked about this when we talked about tempesting dragons. But call for aid is really really good this season for scoring lead into the maelstrom because lead into the maelstrom yes. doesn't require the, the unit to be in your starting army. So if you revive a unit at the end, like in the combat phase when your screen dies and, and you know your turn is coming up next, you can position your hero and vanquishers to both charge in and some kind of combat that you could survive because um, you could just walk up five inches, you have a four inch charge, right? So call for aid is really useful for that. Uh, my second thought is you could swap call for aid for steadfast march because the cron spine allows you to reroll, run and charge. So you could, for example, mm -hmm. with your fulminators, uh, get a rerollable run and charge, or with the chariot even, right? Like adding that extra threat range is really, really useful, yeah, especially for what you're talking sure. about having the chariot run forward, slam into stuff, just tie it down, uh, just Tokyo drift into some stuff, you know, and then hold it there for the fulminators. <laughs> That's really useful. Yo, horizontal Tokyo drift for sure. For sure. My last thing is just, I love this two fulminator squad. There's so many lists where I'm finding yeah. 240 points to fill a battle line slot. It opens up another screen, like, for example, the Chariot here wouldn't fit if you didn't have Fulminators. Like, if you just brought Vanquishers mm -hmm. as battle line and then brought Fulminators, you wouldn't have enough points left over for the Chariot. So, basically, Fulminators open up, like, utility screening slots, which you'll see in the next couple lists, especially with Griffhounds. Uh, but the two Fulminators feel really good, you know, because if there's so many times where the four or six Tempesters... They feel like they're not going to be enough to score Draconith Destruction. Like, let's say I'm trying to shoot into a block of 30 defensive dudes of some kind, you know, and it's like, ah, that's not really reliable oh, that, enough with just the Tempesters. Absolutely. Having that charging Fulminator be a Draconith to score that is very useful. Um, they're just a good unit in general, right? Like a two Fulminator mm -hmm. block feels like it does enough damage that you don't need to reinforce it. Uh, and, and then, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's those are the three things I wanted to mention. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I think the Fulminators feel good because people might even ignore them seeing there's only two of them. Uh, and their their damage output can still be massive even when they're in twos. Uh, what I really That's like true. is, yeah, the only change I would possibly see making is maybe cutting down the Tempesters to four and taking like a Crosswood Judicator. Uh, 
Mm. Just so, because mm -hmm. like I feel like, uh, just for like more battle tactics or more screen clearing, so you could clear a screen with them and shoot tempestors into something more valuable, because they're fairly mm -hmm. short range compared to adjudicators. Yes. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, but other than that, I think this list is pretty solid. Like I would, I pretty much have all these units. I might give this a go. So actually, I don't have six. I'll have to magnetize the other temp. Uh, Guard, but yeah we did talk about a six tempester list earlier in this uh in this episode uh and it was a bit different what i wanted to do was you know buff the unit up with mystic shield uh lord castellan and then teleport it into the middle of the board and for that right. i definitely want high priest right like i don't want that translocation to fail if that's my whole plan um no. this you're just no. dropping them out of reserve so what you could even do on turn one is drop them with the knight relictor from reserve um because the Knight Relictor will just translocate them anywhere they need to go the following turn. Because that's mm -hmm. one of the big problems with Tempesters is like, unless you get that middle of the board drop, and then you can kind of swing one way or the other, depending on what your opponent's going to do, they can often get stuck on a, on the side of a board, especially with the battle plans we have these days. They get stuck on one side, and then round three, they do nothing because your opponent is on the other side of the board. You know, Have you ever had that happen? Happens all the time, but... So I I think I think I think you're right. That might happen. I think his list might play a little differently because they'll be too busy dealing with their cron spine. Yeah, Which... yeah, you can't ignore it. Like you're trying to pin stuff down. They're not running away. For me, I I yeah. let my yeah. opponents move more. I guess. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I in our list, our tempesters were the main sort of threat that they would have to focus on. Like it was like we're dropping six tempesters. We buffed them to the guilds, and you know that's what's going to be drawing the opponent's attention. In this case, the cron spine is going to be hopefully, and then you know the storm strike chair is like a secondary line of defense, and then the fulminators, who like you can't ignore either because they're just going to kill everything if they don't if, if you let them just you know run loose. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's been the theme of this list is just like there's quite a few threats, and so it's hard to prioritize. I think play if you were playing against this. Mm -hmm. No, I, I I love it. Yeah, it's I, I think it's a pretty solid list and. I uh, might uh, play it this weekend myself. <laughs> nice. play, it, play it while you can. Who knows what's going to happen to the Cron Spine after Nova? Yeah, I know. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see, won't we? Here's another weird one. Uh, this is using the Domitan Storm Coven, so it qualifies as a unique's list. Now, the core of this list, this is called the Evocator Missiles, and the idea here is you use a Battle Mage. I know Jack is. Ah, oh, Jack just left. Too. Damn. <laughs> um, it's using the new battle mage with the realmstone orb in order to get plus six inch range to casting spells the idea here is you keep him on the back edge and you cast the louch on forward while you're out of an enemy on binding range so it's less likely to fail then the evocators take a ride on louch on after getting buffed up uh, by themselves with empower and also hoarfrost and also storm coven giving them strike first uh, because five evocators with strike first are a very serious threat your opponent has to deal with. And the theory is you should be able to shoot off threats to them uh, with the Tempesters and then the Long Strikes and the Storm Coven shooting. And it's called the Evocator Missiles because you're just sending out, you know, wave after wave of Louch on Soul Seeker, uh, carrying five evocators who then get to move and charge. And um, yeah, if you guys haven't seen what evocators do in combat, they're nasty. And when you give them Ren 2, Ren 3, they are very nasty. Um, and then when you give them strike first, they are even nastier. And if you happen to be fighting a wizard, because you are a wizard finder, uh, they're they're incredibly nasty for only five models. Um, it gets really gross. So this is a, a very silly list concept. Relies on so many dice rolls to get things going. Um, but... I'm, it's it, it'll happen. It'll you'll pull it off, and you'll feel like uh, like a god because there's nothing that can charge into those evocators. I still want Storm Coven go down a little bit. I have I've actually been enjoying the Storm Coven. Um, it's not they're not an awful unit. Um, Strike first is very strong. Um, I wish they didn't have the you have to be in the quarter like the extra part of it. I wish it was just like give a unit strike first on an eight. That have been amazing. Well, the quarter thing exists because the spell has no range, right? Which is one of the nice yeah. things about it. You can put the evocators on the front line to ride Louch on, and the Storm Coven can stay all the way at the table edge, cast uh, cast all the spells they need to without... without They just need to see the unit, right? And yes. the Knight Relictor is in here because after you do that, you can also translocate the Storm Coven into whatever quarter they need to be next turn in order to to buff the those same evocators again um, or just start sniping stuff, right? Like, their shooting is not terrible like it's it's not good but it's not terrible 
Um, and they are three models with Thunderstrike. So, yeah, there's there's possibilities there to steal objectives. Um, I know I know James has been running a version of this list, and let's let's skip to that here. He calls it Paw Patrol, and instead of using you know two squads of foot evocators, he uses a big meaty squad of of six Dracolines, and six Dracolines on Lauchon is the most threat range you can have, at least with Stormcast, maybe you know, anything in the game, it's really hard to, to match this, um, especially with melee power, right? Like, usually if you have a unit moving this fast, it's like Lumineth doubling the move on a, on a Wind Spirit or something. This is a ridiculous amount of movement. So, Lauchon moves 18, then the Dracolines get off the boat, and then they get to move 12, usually, you know, plus D6, they get to run and charge with Steadfast March, and uh, then they charge twelve inches up to 12 inches with a reroll. <laughs> It's a ridiculous amount of threat range. Um, no corner of the battlefield is safe. You are getting charged by the st- by the uh, the six Dracolines. And they're going to have strike first usually, so you can't just charge into them without taking heavy casualties. And they're going to be dropping in four Tempesters, usually behind a screen of Liberators, uh, to shoot out screens and make sure that the Dracolines hit what they need to. And to make it even spicier, you can drop Griff Hounds near the Tempesters so that if any unit tries to set up within 12 inches, the Tempesters get to shoot immediately. So that's going to be really useful against zombies, against other deep strike armies, against summoning. Um, super useful ability to have. I love the Griff Hounds here. Um, if you want to see this list in action, James and I played a mirror match of, of me playing Comet Fall against his Paw Patrol. And uh, James has also done some battle reports on our Discord server. So uh, hop in there and you can see him play it against Coalesce and some other armies as well. Uh, but this is a scary list. You have to play against it very, very carefully in order to, to beat it. Um, Fight first Dracolines, man. They're nasty. I don't know many things that can charge into that and survive. And even if you do, it's like you have to charge in half your army just to kill that unit, and you lose a big chunk of it on the way. Yeah, I I think... Surprisingly, I haven't seen too many um, six-man evocator lists, um, at least when I've been scrolling through PCP. But I really feel like we're going to start seeing them a lot, lot more. Um... If you if you, if anybody listening has not played with even three, like go proxy them. Like I'm te- like we're telling you, like even three evocators and Dracoline are really really good, and they will put, pull their weight if you position them well. I Frost just makes them downright deadly. Like like they're already pretty deadly, but it makes them like insanely valuable if you can get even like negative two rend on. Um... Yeah, Warfrost themselves. Yeah. Warfrost and these guys, like, oh man, just the yeah, rent on the mounts. It's nasty. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oof. <laughs> like, what is it? Nine attacks, three attacks per model, so eighteen with the mounts. Yeah. Oh yeah, six, uh, six and three. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking a unit of three, but yeah. Yeah, and this list also has the translocation into merciless blizzard combo because the encanter there has shaman of the chilled lands. Um, James also runs celestial blades here because anytime he wants to score magical dominance by taking an aggressive turn one. The Draculines will be in range of unbinding, and he still wants to give them plus one to wound, so he'll just give them Celestial Blades instead. Yeah, it's it's a good list. Um, oh man, I I think there's 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 so many possibilities for Strike First Draculines. Like I feel like one of the best Stormcast lists is just going to have this package of just the six Draculines and Stormcoven, not necessarily Lauchon and all the other stuff, but that package is just man, it's deadly. It just tactically, there's not it really limits what your opponent can do. Yeah. And the, the base size is reasonably big enough where, because now you don't have to do three by two, you could just do one by six, like, line with them. Yeah. Like, it's really nice how much board space, like, because of that rule that we just gained, like, quest stores that could line up now and the Dracolines that can line up around. Like, the like taking away board is such a huge part of this game. Oh, you know what this list needs? Morgan, you're going to love this. You ready? Yeah. Levitate. <laughs> Blind cats, yeah. Yeah, just charge over screens. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, I find trouble fitting Dracolines over things because people don't leave that much of a gap. But you just you just need the one model to do the lightning arc. That's it. True. Yeah, I mean, I, I find the lightning arc insanely valuable because uh, you know you can just target the hero that's sitting behind them for lookouts or protection and just nuke it out of existence. Yeah. And that often solves a lot of problems in itself, like especially if you're up against something like Soulblade. 
Mm -hmm. or, or it just pours more damage into the same unit you were already fighting, or you pick a completely mm -hmm. different unit and you just wipe it out too. Like, oh, here's 10 wounds of a screen. It's gone. Like, in addition to yeah. whatever the advocators attacked, it's, mm -hmm. oh man, I love that ability. I like how, like, they can't, like, respond to it. It's not yeah. part of the attack itself, it, it, so they can't, like, like, it, you can target something and, you know, Nighthawk can trigger, like, a fire. It feels like a proper third edition ability in terms of power level, you know? Like, there's not a lot of other stuff that has this kind of finesse built into it with Stormcast. They got it right on the first try. Yeah, didn't need to <laughs> modify it from second edition. All right, let's talk about another archetype here called Cometfall. Um, this is a, a once in a while, every now and then, you'll see somebody go like 4150 with a list that just has like a whole bunch of Night Vexilors and some Shield Annihilators and Celestin and Prime. And it's because they, every round of, the, every first turn of every game, they just killed half the opponent's army with like 63 mortal wounds. Like every important thing in their army is just dead and the game just grinds to a halt and there's nothing your opponent can do about it. That, we call that Comet Fall, right? You just deal a whole bunch of splash mortal wounds with meteors. Uh, usually Night Vexel or Banners are good for this. Shield Annihilators are good for this because they're cheap in their battle line. Um, there's a big problem with this list, though, in that if you don't kill your opponent with that play, like let's say you're you're playing against these new battle plans where you have very spread deployments and you don't get that range that you need, um, or if you're just playing with against something that's like has a ton of wounds, like Gargans, right? <laughs> if you face Gargans, you just lose automatically, almost. Because uh, this list doesn't do enough damage to kill one Gargit, much less four. Um, and that's a big problem with this list. But I think this season we could do something like three Night Vexilors swapping in uh, for a standard list. So you can see if looking through this list, you've got the typical things we've been talking about. Stuff like the Encanter. Um, you've got Vanguard Hunters for Battle Tactics, Vanquishers, Fulminators, Tempesters, Dracolines, Long Strikes, like all the hits, right? And then you've got these three Night Vexilors slotted in here. And the idea is instead of bringing... 240 points of Fulminators, you bring 240 points of Vexilers, and that helps you fill a Warlord Battalion and helps you get Call for Aid, which is basically paying for itself because you can now revive your Vanquishers, for which are worth about 100 points. Um, the Knight Vexilor kind of just takes the place of something like a, a Knight Zephyros. You give it the Arcane Tome, and it's not like it's a big, uh, big swap. Uh, and then I added a little bit more spice here with the Lord Arcanum, who's going to be casting the Malevolent Maelstrom with plus six inch range. That means the Maelstrom can go deep into enemy lines and explode on top of all these other meteors that you're dropping. Um, this list did really well for me in round one of my league uh, game. Um, I, I like it, and it's something I definitely want to keep experimenting with. I don't know if, if Hammers of Sigmar is the optimal way to go. I think it's something that I really want to experiment with more once we see more point drops and more, like, maybe, like, if we get a new battle tactic, that would be nice. Um, but it's something I'm going to explore more after the next battle scroll. But it feels good. It really does feel good to just have, like, a... At the start of the first turn, if your opponent forces you to go first, okay, your heroes are dead. 3d3 mortal wounds, they just usually die, right? Um, and that feels really good. Feels like we, what we used to be able to do with long strikes. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do it anymore though all right let's uh Murgonk, let's talk about your 50 obr list which you called fair and balanced <laughs> which yeah. uh yeah certainly certainly seems that way doesn't it when you're going 50 with it <laughs> yeah um yeah i called it selective blindness but uh no so okay so for those of you who don't know, right now, normally it's kind of popular, even if MetaWatch doesn't seem to think so. I would say it's the most popular OBR subfaction. Um, but everyone and their mom that I know of is running Catacross, Arkin, Bone Shaper, six Immortus, five Cavalos, five Cavalos. And then the other two things are like a flex slot. They typically run something like either three more Immortus Guard or three Necropolis Stalkers or a Margast Archive. And that's the list, and you just pop all your buffs up, and the Immortus Guard with their recursion on a 3-up, and all the 1-up save that they have effectively are unkillable, for more or less, and that's how they win. Uh, I went for a different direction, because that list seems incredibly boring to me, but, uh, you know, uh, death is very much uh, a grand allegiance that draws around the unique heroes, and so I took Arkin because I think his buffs are key. Um... I took two Bone Shapers for Recursion, and because I would have honestly liked to, liked to have t taken a Soul Mason or like even Walk Mordian. Unfortunately, I really like the Antorian Acolytes Battalion for a Primal Dice, 
and you don't get that if you take Soul Mason because he's not does uh, he doesn't fit because his chair counts as a mount for some bizarre reason. I guess because it has legs is the bizarre reason. Um, and then instead of going for a Mortis Guard, who I think are necessary, but they should not be your primary hammer because I think their damage is low. I think Stalkers are the real damage unit in this army. Uh, I went for Stalkers. Uh, it's take, you know with their defensive stance, I'm not losing too much out on the uh, defensive capabilities. And then the points for um, Catacros I use towards a block of Immortus card, a Morgast Archai. Soul Steel Carrying Aether Void Pendulum. Uh, I figured that uh, Soul Blight and Null Myriad were going to be really popular, and my plan was essentially to use the Morgast Archai and Pendulum sort of as a hedge against that list where I could maybe tag Catacros or tag whatever I wanted to kill uh, in OBR with Morgast Archai, put an Aether Void Pendulum into Catacros, force the Immortus to pass wounds to them. Um, and Pendulum is just good for sniping, you know, small foot heroes out in other armies uh, with Arkans extended range. Um, I took Merciless Blizzard because since I'm running the Antarian Acolytes Battalion, sometimes OBR doesn't have a, like a whole host of spells they want to cast other than Mystic Shield, Drain Vitality, and Empowered Natarite weapons. Um, in that sense, I went, okay, you know what? If they're close enough uh, and I have a ton of uh, Primal Dice remaining because of my battalion, I'll put it into Merciless Blizzard and I don't have to commit to it because I can see what my role is and then commit the Primal Dice to it. And the carrion is there because uh, OBR in general is a very elite list, and while it has no problem uh, el- killing a lot of threats or just units in general, uh, they can get outnumbered on objectives pretty easily. Uh, and I was afraid of Soul Blight doing that to me with a ton of zombies or just skeletons in general, just chaff. Um, and so the carrion just exists as a no, you're not going to take that objective away from me, and uh, unless it's your turn and you dispel it on your turn, because dispelling it in my turn isn't going to do much for you in your turn. Right. Um, and what were your matchups, yeah. by the way? Did you end up facing Soul Blight so that the carrying really came in handy? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So my first game was against a Gitz list with a bunch of Trogets. Um, it did not go well for him. He would not take the Antorian Acolytes Battalion. I was able to unbind all of their key spells because I had the extra one, which is why I loved how that battalion worked. Uh, the Trogets were tough, but uh, really, he couldn't keep up with my recursion of the Stalkers, and I was able to just tempo into him and just destroy all his... Uh, I trolled. It was just mainly like a rock a Trogat spam with like a Mangler Swing or two, like and a couple of big uh, Trogat bosses thrown in there. Uh, so yeah, I was able to do tactics and, you know, it, it was a bit of a grind. I did lose some units, but towards the end, it, he just can't keep up with what OBR is trying to do. And Drain Vitality, Arkin, I think I got Curse of Years on his Mangler Squig and did 14 Mortal Wounds to it or something. Uh, so yeah, it, it just, it was a steal. And then game two, I faced Null Myriad. The Catacross Arkin combo, but this time they were running six Stalkers instead of six Immortus. Um, the clutch ended up being uh, uh, the uh, Morgas Archive because I was able to get them into the six Stalkers alongside my Stalkers, uh, my own Stalkers, and just finish clean that unit up entirely. Because uh, turns out Morgas Archive also fight first when they charge charge on an eight, so you can double fight essentially. Yeah, uh, and, and, with no, and with no five up board, that just cuts right through. Yep, no 5 aboard, no allowed defense. So despite the Catacros giving them a plus 1 and Arkans Mystic Shield, I had negative 3 rend uh, with Bludgeon. So there was nothing really they could do about that. Uh, so the max they were going to save it on a 5 up. So, you know, it worked out in my favor. Uh, game 3, I faced Korn. Uh, they were running, I believe, just Skull Reapers, Blood Warriors, uh, Bloodthirster with Fight First, uh, a bunch of Priests. Uh, and they were running a bunch of Untamed Beasts and Claws of Karanak to try and murder Lust and tag me. Unfortunately, the entirety of OBR has retreat and charge. So it doesn't do much when you tag my screens with uh, my Cavalos Death Rider screens with uh, your Claws of Karanak, because I'm just going to retreat and charge you anyway. I have a ton of command points. Uh, and luckily, like I was able to play around. He like p- uh, put up his Skull Reapers and his Fight First Bloodthirster in a really aggressive position to where he could... Oh, it wasn't it wasn't the 3 6 charge. It was the Insensate Rage with the Fight First. Uh, but what I was able to do is tag a corner of his Skull Reapers with my uh, Stalkers and then pile in in such a way where my 3-inch Falchions were able to hit across from him into his Bloodthirster. And that way I was able to take the Bloodthirster and the Skull Reapers out with my Stalkers. Nice. And, yeah, and so his fight first basically went unanswered because there was nothing for him to fight. And then that's after which I piled within three of him. Yeah. Um, well, that's, so yeah, it worked out in my... Uh, that's why we always say how you charge is more important than actually charging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, positioning was was very, very key. Uh, I even had to risk a couple of five-ups where I was like, well, I might not kill the full Skull Reaper unit. I don't want him retreating and rallying. So I tagged the Blood Secretor with Curse of Years. He rolled a two on his Spell Ignore, and I was able to just uh, nuke his Secretor off the board. So he lost his plus one attack. And uh, um, 
uh, four up rally uh, banner. So that was so that was that game went pretty smooth, all things considered. Um, OBR tactics always ended up doing two of OBR tactics because they're just extremely useful. Uh, namely the trample the defiant, which is you end the charge of the cavalos within three of an enemy unit and stay that way until the end of the turn. And then um, the one where you have to contest an objective wholly outside your territory with an Immortus Guard and a uh, Immortus unit, uh, which I have two of. So that really helped. Uh, I think game four, I faced um, a good opponent, Sean. He actually ended up going, I want to say, 4-1. Um, he was playing Soul by Grave Lords, Legion of Night, with Manfred, uh, Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, a bunch of skeletons, bunches of zombies, a couple of foot heroes. Uh, he made a key mistake. He so he used Manfred to teleport towards arcane terrain. Uh, I took turn one because I did not want him getting on objectives, um, and he came closer to me. Unfortunately, because of where the arcane terrain was placed, uh, even though he ended up getting a plus one to cast and unbind, he ended up being in range of my terrain and arcan uh, with his plus six range of spells. So I was able to curse a years him for ten mortal wounds. Um, and then he forgot that I have the, uh, the terrain piece uh, does minus three to charge. I was able to get that off on a five. And so when I put Catalyst Death Riders near him and he tried to countercharge me by issuing redeploy at Manfred and try to get a fight first on them, he couldn't because he needed uh, 10 when they were seven inches away. And so I was able to charge him with Death Riders and finish him off. Um, and after that, the tempo of the game was sort of decided. He lost, I think, Manfred top of my turn one. Because he just ended up putting him in a really bad position. And then Soul Seal Carrion just made sure his zombies and 30 skeletons never contested a key objective. And I was able to decide the pace of the game from there. Nice. Um, uh, and then finally, my last match was against another Null Myriad Mirror. Uh, it was Catacros, six Immortus Guard this time. You're just a typical cookie cutter list that you've been seeing everywhere. Um, and this essentially, this was on the. Um, the where the missions alternate between A and B, and it's like two, only two. So it was pretty much a grind for the first three turns until I got a double. And I was able to force him into a position where I baited him into getting greedy with Catacross and Arkin to try to get them into combat. But that would mean his Immortus in the center would have to stretch out. And what ended up happening was the way he ended up moving and piling in, I was able to put enough wounds into Catacross because he does not get the uh, Null Maria protection from spells with Aetherwhite Pendulum and a Curse of Years that forced him to kill enough Immortus to where he could only choose to support one of his heroes. It was either going to be Catacross or Arkin. Um, so with that, I was able to... He chose Arkin uh, as far as his protection target goes, and then I was able to clean up our uh, Catacross with six Stalkers, put enough wounds into Arkin to essentially bring the Immortus Guard down to, like, one wound, uh, and Arkin himself to, like, four, three wounds remaining. I mean, he saw the writing on the wall. I had, like, pretty much all my army alive except for five Death Riders, and he had one Bone Shaper, one Immortus, and Arkin alive. And so, yeah, the game was decided that we were there. Very nice. We weird matchups. Um... I guess that's kind of what the the meta is at right now, though. It's like a lot of death and corn. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much all we're seeing. Which, which is yes, I basically teched for the Null Myriad Mirror and uh, Soul Black Dread Lords. Uh, I was afraid of shooting because it, my trait, as you can see, is diversionary tactics. I was very much built into melee counter charges, uh, facing the Null Myriad Mirror, facing corn possibly. And yeah, I think diversionary tactics is awesome uh, currently in this meta. Uh, but there was a list there that was, I think, Caradron Overlords with 30 Thunderers, an Ironclad, a Gun Hauler. I was very scared of that one. Uh, luckily, I didn't fight it. Uh, the person I beat in round five got to fight in round four, and they had Aura of Sterility, which is what they needed to beat them. So, Yeah, I'm a little torn on how OBR is going to do, let's say, if they get nerfed in the next Battle Scroll. If there's any justice in the world, they will get nerfed. <laughs> yeah, but, I'm, um, I'm excited to see, too. The last time they nerfed OBR, they went from a 65% win rate to 38% win rate until they got points drops like two years later to help them get back up. But Yeah. yeah. Yeah, frankly, I think the the game would have been better off if Petrifex wasn't nerfed because then we wouldn't have Null Myriad everywhere, <laughs> choking the meta out. No, I think you would have still seen Null Myriad to be honest. Like the minute they released Seraphon, everyone switched to Null Myriad. Actually, no, not even that. Seraphon is just one a problem. The main problem was Geminids. When they released Geminids in its current iteration, every OBR player has to switch to Null Myriad because if you get Geminids off, that army just dies. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know how I feel about um, such a strong and and reliable spell ignore tied to heroes that are basically impossible to kill with shooting. You know what I mean? It's like mm. you have to deal with this army in melee, and that's a hard thing to balance, I, right? I will say the 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 the, the 
while I agree two up is too reliable and it could probably be three up and be fine because it is, you have to be holy with a nine of a hero. I think it's still fine because it means you, you are very predictable in where you go. Um, there's a lot of times, I think, at least two or three times in this tournament where I couldn't just be like, oh, I'm going to add plus three to my Morgas Archive, my Cavalos Death Riders, move 13 inches, charge into you, and just kill you. Because I was like, you have Arkan. So if I get them out of my hero range, I will no longer have my spell ignore, and you'll just spell them down with like Arkan or with Drain Vitality yeah. and with, or with uh, Curse of Years. It, it so you have to be very careful. Yep. It restricts the movement of an already slow army. Yes. Now, granted, that's not always a bad thing, because if you're running a Catacross Arkan list, the slow castle is how you want to be playing anyway, and if there's three or four objectives on the board, you can guarantee yourselves at least two with that sort of play style. But it means like you're very limited tactically, and like my list was trying to be tactical, so I, I really needed to make those key decisions where I'm like, okay, I will choose to get out of my spell ignore range to go try to get this battle tactic or like destroy this unit or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, I think OBR are, are a very well designed um, elite army. Maybe not like they've got internal balance problems, right? The fact that you don't see uh, crawlers or harvesters or a lot of more tech guard is a problem. A lot of the heroes are just yeah. not seeing play either. They've got some big internal balance problems. Uh, but conceptually, as an elite army, they feel like an elite army and they play like an elite army. And um, yeah, their tools feel fine generally. Maybe the, like like we've said many times before. I think recursion could be tweaked to ten max, ten moons max. Um, no, Mary can be switched to a three up. I, I think those are more for external reasons more than anything because it's like awful to play against uh, when you, you know you have tools and they mean absolutely nothing or you can't do thirty wounds to like a two up or three up save uh, all in one go. Um, but I think points wise, I think maybe just the Mortis go to two forty or they lose the battle line option. And I, I, the army just needs like more tool, more list building options in terms of points. It's like they have the exact opposite problem of Stormcast, where like they have all the allegiance abilities and toolbox abilities they could ever need. Uh, their points are just whack and make list building really awkward. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, totally. I guess we'll see what the battle scroll brings for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, curious to see. I mean, if they maintain a steady 52 55, you know, I'd still love to play this army. Then it actually becomes a challenge as opposed to just. You know, some armies that I, I looked at their list and I'm like, if I face this, it's going to be a pushover. I'm not even going to feel threatened. And I don't know. Like, from a from a meta perspective, that doesn't feel very healthy. Yeah. Ooh, that was a lot of lists. Okay. <laughs> it's a lot a lot to digest. Uh, it's a lot of Tempesters and Dracolines. Hopefully, hopefully there was enough variation in there. But, uh, man, the battle tactics and the recent point changes are really pushing us towards those units and, and more of our competitive lists. So it's hard... It's hard to see a list that doesn't have either Tempesters or Dracolines in it, but uh, hopefully there was enough variety in here anyway. Uh, so thank you everybody for watching. Thank you to everybody who continues to to tune into our podcast. It's actually really just amazing that people are, are finding our, our show interesting. Uh, so thank you very much for watching and thank you to our Patreon supporters and YouTube members who, who fund the show and help us uh, justify all the time we waste on this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you guys think we missed anything with our lists or if our analysis is lacking in some way, then leave a comment down below the video or come onto our Discord server and and yell at us. Um, we talk about Stormcast and, and Age of Sigmar in general all day, every day. You know, if you want to post your models, if you want to join our community contests, if you want to do list building for all armies, uh, if you want to post your battle reports or read other people's battle reports, our Discord server is is a great community. Um, that, I mean, a lot of the people who come on the podcast are people we've found in the community um uh, like john and david <laughs> who are great new additions to the team really stoked to have you guys on here so thank you very much for uh cool. dealing with the the deadlines of getting your lists in and, and recording schedules and all that so thank you very much for coming yeah thanks excited to be here please consider supporting the gang by becoming a member on youtube or joining us at patreon.com slash the stormkeep uh, coming up next on the podcast, we have How to Counter Corn. Uh, we've got more battle reports coming. I've got a game with uh, so a competitive Skaven list. I, I know it's like like a cripple fight watching Stormcast fight Skaven these days, but uh, hopefully it'll still be an interesting game. And uh, maybe Murgonk's still working on that How to Play Annihilators video that we talked I about. I think that should be that should be ready like really soon. I think if you could, uh, I know Paul's got a game Tuesday, so if you could grab some pictures, like live pictures, because I haven't had time to get live pictures. I was I was doing like little circles on a on an empty field on like MS Paint. So yeah, that'd be, that'd, that'd, that would be good. Yeah, sure. Well, maybe Corpse can help you uh, increase the yeah, production. Yeah, post them there. up. Yeah, post them up. I'll take a look. Sure.
All right, so there's lots more to look forward to. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we will see you in the next one. Cheers. See ya.